Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It's September 19th, 2022. And we are so excited to have as special guest, recurring occasional co-host, Samantha Shelley, back in the house. Samantha. Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much. Those of you who don't know, Samantha and her bestie, one of her besties, <laughs> Tanner Gilliland, came on Mormon Stories, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, and did an episode called Losing Mormon Millenniums, Millennials. That is one of the most popular uh, Mormon Stories episodes of all time. It's what got Tyler Glenn of Neon Trees to uh, <laughs> listen to Mormon Stories for the first time. You love saying that. <laughs> um, Samantha has been on Mormon Stories several times since then. She is the co-host of Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel and Instagram channel and TikTok channel with, with uh, Tanner. She's also a life coach and is super wise. And I have sent uh, not only friends, but also even maybe a family member to, to Samantha. So I can recommend her in all the ways. Well, Welcome. Glowing. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, and uh, Samantha, it was you who brought this interview interviewee to us. Yes. This is a no brainer for you, John. <laughs> <laughs> and for our audience. A very lucky get. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, today we are super excited to have in the house a name that will be familiar to you in one way or another to many of you, and maybe not to some others, but we're super excited to have Daniel Spencer at the house. Hello. Hey, Daniel Spencer. Hello. How's it going? Welcome. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So Daniel uh, uh, is many things. I'm going to pull up my, my list of his bio. <laughs> He was raised as a Mormon in Zimbabwe, and I don't think we've ever had a Zimbabwean on Mormon Stories before, as far as I know. No? Yeah? yeah. I think I'm the first. I also don't think we've ever had a white African on Mormon Stories, which is something I've always wanted to at least nab a, a Mormon from South Africa. But yeah. Zimbabwe is awesome. So that's kind of cool. And you found the, like, the smallest demographic, a white <laughs> Zimbabwean African? There you go. That's... <laughs> Yeah, but that's an important perspective. Yeah. So uh, we're super excited to get into the history of that. But Daniel Spencer is also a stand-up comedian. Um, he has a special on Dry Bar, which I am told is something cool on YouTube. Is that right? <laughs> it's very cool. It's very cool. <laughs> um, but he also has a YouTube channel under Daniel Spencer. He has a TikTok account with, drumroll please, Samantha. 1.7 million followers. 1.7 million <laughs> followers on TikTok. Um, he also has an Instagram, and his handle is Dan Dan Bam at both those a channel. Dan Bam Bam. Dan Bam Bam. Dan but yeah, bam, if you bam. Never get it wrong. Spencer, I'm like a pink. Yeah, I have a pink hat on. So. It's Dan Bam Bam. It's You'll such see a, him. It's such a it's such a hard thing to like even okay. remember. But yeah. Dan Bam Bam, thank you. Samantha, <laughs> Samantha always corrects me in a very diplomatic way when I'm wrong. <laughs> but um if those if none of this means anything to you, but you've been watching kind of Mormon or ex Mormon TikTok you'll remember a guy with kind of a British sounding accent to those who aren't uh, refined, where he's like asking BYU students if they swear and what their favorite swear words are. <laughs> he's asking BYU <laughs> students to serve if they serve and they're doing this pose that oh, I had no idea what it sorry. meant. If they'd rather because, watch porn or die a horrible, gruesome death. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. one was illuminating. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you'll see Daniel twerking. You'll see him imitating the royal family. Yep. But he's just a brilliant comedian. And Samantha, Thank tell you. us why you wanted Daniel to be on Mormon Stories. Because Daniel is perfect. <laughs> and his natural storytelling Thank abilities you. are wonderful. He was in my apartment just giving me like the short version of his Mormon story. And I was like, God, I would listen to four hours of this, yeah. which I don't say often. <laughs> you don't watch every episode of Mormon Stories podcast? Of course I watch every episode <laughs> <laughs> at half speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there may be some other cool themes that are really important, like Maybe some LGBT themes, maybe. Oh, very much so, yes. And maybe some Spoiler. faith crisis, faith transition kind of themes as well. Definitely, yeah. And did you attend BYU? I did. I so there's BYU. some BYU themes. And John, lest we forget, Daniel was on Provo's Most Eligible. Yes. The Mormon Bachelor. The Mormon Bachelor. Do you know about this? Well, didn't you and Tanner yes, like that's review how that we on Zelf on the Shelf? Off, Dan, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, okay. So were you like a mini celebrity at BYU at one uh, point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very that's much so. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's weird to say that, but yeah, very much a Mormon celebrity at one point. And I'm just going to hit this directly. Like sometimes I have listeners who are grumpy that we sometimes interview kind of social media personalities on Mormon stories. And I can say I get it. And we are never going to stop interviewing just normal people on Mormon stories. That's part of our bread and butter. We love it. We will always do that. 
I do also love to interview um, sometimes social media personalities on Mormon Stories for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're often interesting and fun, um, but they're also, it's very, it's very scary and courageous coming out of um, Mormonism to speak openly about your experiences there. And I think that courage deserves to be rewarded sometimes as well. Yeah. And so I'm not ashamed to occasionally bring on um, a post-Mormon superstar. And that's kind of what I, what I've done. That I love that title. Sure I'm going to put that in like that. My, my bio, <laughs> post-Mormon superstar. Unashamed. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, in this day and age, social media is, it's, it drives the culture or it's at least such a reflection of culture. So it'd be insane if you didn't have, yeah. you know, yeah. people with 1.7 million Twitter followers <laughs> who are speaking to, you know, Mormons and ex-Mormons. I mean, it's not just ex-Mormons that love your content, you know? Yeah, totally. Very true. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't think there's 1.7 million Mormons on TikTok, right? Mormons are ex-Mormons. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh yeah. That would be a massive chunk of the day. Yeah. I mean, Dan's mainstream funny, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And his stuff's really, really fun. Yeah, but but don't worry, we will never stop interviewing just bread and butter Mormon stories. So, all right. <laughs> so sorry, we're bringing this amazing celeb on today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Please don't stop Please, donating. Please, we're so sorry. Like, ugh, it's just the word. <laughs> all right. So, um, any other <clears throat> additions or corrections to the intro, or any disclaimers you want to offer? Because you said you maybe you're a little bit nervous to do this, even though you're an international superstar. So, like, yeah. any disclaimers or you know. No, uh, it, I mean, obviously, I don't know. Whenever I think of Mormon stories, I always think of just like, I feel like it's like the pinnacle, right? Once you end up on Mormon stories, it's like, oh, like he's, he's, he's gone. He's, he's done with the church. He's finished. And it's so interesting because I feel like I have so many people in my life who are still Mormon. And I just don't want people to kind of like listen to this and think like, oh, he... I don't know. Maybe we can get into this and in further into the episode, but I, I'm just really appreciative that I get to be here and get to kind of just meet the people that kind of changed my world a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of changed my perspective. So thank you for that, first of all. And no, I think I'm, yeah, I think you did a great job of just introducing me. I feel like a lot of the stuff that I go through social media wise and all of this sort of stuff, I think it'll be interesting to have people kind of my main goal with even my BYU videos is just to kind of show people a different perspective on Mormons and LDS culture in general. And so it's fun to kind of even just open this up to them and be like, hey, listen to this episode where like I delve into my story a little bit more. So I'm I excited. It. I love it. I love it. Well, um, where should we begin? Where does your Mormon story begin? I like a Zimbabwe Mormon story. I'm yeah. just dying to ask you a gazillion questions. Well, maybe we should start with my parents. Uh, let's let's get into how I grew up in Zimbabwe. Uh, my dad is American uh, from Colorado, and my mom is Zimbabwean. Uh, my mom, her family were converts. Her whole family. I think she was like four or five when the missionaries like baptized her parents. And essentially what ended up happening was missionaries baptized them and my mom was told about Rick's college. And my mom went over to Rick's. She had a roommate there and her roommate ended up being my dad's sister. So they ended up kind of hanging out all the time. They eventually started dating, got married. Uh, they were living in Colorado and my dad got fired from a tire store and my mom was like, hey, like, there's not a lot of options here. Maybe we should just go on like vacation, kind of figure stuff out. And eventually what ended up happening was they went on vacation and just never came back to America. <laughs> and they, yeah, had all of us over there. I think that, well, they had my first sister in Colorado and then the rest of us were all born and raised in Zim. And Zim stands for Zimbabwe Samantha. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, uh, basically what ended up happening was that they, yeah, they raised us and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Now we're going to have to back up a tiny bit. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I think I may have missed this. So was your mom a convert to the church or, or was she born into the church? She, so she was five. So I guess convert okay. kind of. Okay. Her, um, parents, her parents converted to the church. Yeah. Yeah. Her parents she was converted. Five. Yeah. Okay. And do you, do you know anything about what converted her parents to the church? Um, my grandfather has a whole biography about it. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I read it fully. <laughs> um, 
But basically, they were in Zambia. He was working in the copper, uh, copper belt as a miner, I guess. And essentially what happened is that there was a day where he was sick, I guess. And uh, it just so happened to be the day that the missionaries came over and they were like, it was a miracle. We were converted to the church, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, the, the rigmarole of like, and I, they found us. They found us on that day. Um, and essentially, kind of what I guess converted my mom, I get like... <coughs> I think it was honestly just being able to like grow up in the church and kind of see, I don't know, maybe that's just her story to tell. I don't really know if I've ever really asked my mom that question, actually. Like, what converted you? Like, what made you change? I, I do know that she was raised in it and that she loved it. Um, they were very much a part of the early church in Zimbabwe. Uh, actually, in Rhodesia, I guess, was the name of it at that point. And then they kind of were the transition from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. Um, it's very interesting. I feel like with uh, kind of the like overturning of the like priesthood rule, uh, a lot of white Zimbabweans like left the church, and the only people that kind of stayed were my grandparents, um, and they kind of led a whole bunch of branches. My grandfather was kind of in charge of all the like branch work essentially. So they'd go out into like the rural bush areas, and they'd go and like teach black people or black Africans the gospel um and so my mom would have to go in and this is during like civil war time as well where uh zimbabweans were fighting for their independence and so from, my mom would from, always from who uh british rule okay colonial rule sorry about that um <laughs> and so it, it was very <laughs> sorry i just got onto that oh sam jeez. uh uh but yeah so it was they like my mom always tells the story of how her mom they'd be driving through and she'd sit with a gun <coughs> just in case because they'd be literally in like war zones going in and to try and teach the gospel. Um, and I think maybe that's where like my mom's conversion process came from is just being able to see, you know, how helpful they were in some shape or form to helping people like learn about the gospel for the first time, you know, going into these places where Honestly, the gospel had never been allowed to be taught. And then suddenly realizing like, hey, we can go here and we can teach people and we can teach them everything. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd say that that probably was a major role in her conversion process. So uh, just to ask about the history really quickly, yeah. um, around what year was the Civil War or well, War of Independence? In so Zimbabwe? they gained independence in 1980. I can't remember exactly. Oh, so like after the priesthood ban was lifted. Yes, oh, okay. uh, after the priest ban. It was basically like that whole war section kind of happened within the 70s. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was like, yeah, 72, roughly. Okay. Uh, but again, I don't know the like full history there. It was, I, didn't, I don't know if I really cared for that hit part of the history, just because it is such a like a weird part. I did have uncles that fought in it uh, on the British side. Um, and so it was very interesting to just kind of like, I don't know, deal with that part of the history. But as far as I know, it was pretty, if I remember correctly, I keep saying that just because I don't want to be like corrected. People are going to jump in the comments and be like, no, it was actually this thing. And it's yeah. like, yeah, I don't know just the full like history, just but yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's interesting because I feel like they ended up like handing it over eventually because they were just like, what are we doing? Why are we fighting in this, in this war essentially? Uh, Zimbabwe at that point was like the bread basket of Africa is how they re like referred to it. Uh, there was a lot to fight for. Zimbabwe is like very minerally wealthy, very like, they just have like tons of platinum, tons of diamonds. There was so many like newspaper articles where people would be like, kids were playing with rocks and we found out they were diamonds. <laughs> and so it was, it was always interesting to like kind of grow up in a country like that, you know? Uh, I have like a cousin who works in gold mining now. Um, and so it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And so I think the British definitely wanted it. But at a certain point, you kind of have to give up and just be like, hey, maybe colonialism's not good. And it's like, yeah, get out <laughs> quickly. So, so was, there a, was there kind of family lore about how your grandparents <laughs> reacted to the lifting of the, pre the, the Mormon priesthood and temple ban on people of African descent? I don't think so. To be honest, I think a, a, a big testament to kind of their story is that they stayed. Uh, as far as I know, every other white member family uh, left 
as soon as that happened. Racism yeah. was very deep in Zimbabwe, especially Rhodesian culture, uh, just because it was supposed to be uh, like British, uh, like the British essentially wanted it to make it the first like white country in Africa. Uh, and so there was very much this rhetoric of or just like narrative of like white people are better. We are, and that was kind of what I grew up with. White people were very condescending, very like just racist, plain racist, um, and very bold about it too. Um, and so it was, it was very interesting growing up because my grandfather was very much the opposite of that. And I don't want to down him in any way, shape or form for that part of his history, he was very, very kind when I was growing up. Uh, he would just, I remember we'd have like car rides where he would just pull off to the side of the road. There would be like mothers. Uh, in Africa, it's very common to find people with giant like bags on their heads, particularly women. They'll carry like piles and piles of stuff on their heads, super strong necks. Um, and basically he'd just pull off to the side of the road and be like, where do you need to go? And they'd tell him and he'd just go kilometers off of his path uh, to just go and drop off these people wherever they needed to go, whether it was going to a bus stop or actually dropping them off at their homes. Um, and so I think that that was something that kind of converted me in the beginning at least, was just <coughs> like watching my grandfather be like, hey, it doesn't matter who a person is, you always want to be able to kind of help them, be kind to them. Um, and I think my grandfather always kind of adopted that no matter what. Uh, I'm not going to say he's an entirely great man. You know, you have the personal family histories that you grow up hearing about. Uh, but I think in that particular, in, in those particular instances, I was very much attached to my grandfather and knowing that he was like a kind person, a good person, you know. So, so the fact that they stayed a member of the church yeah. after 1978 was a, was a testimony to at least their kindness. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess every, almost every Mormon I know has a story of where they were in night, you know, who's been around long enough has a story of where they were in 1978 when they yeah. heard the, the, the priesthood ban on yeah. black people and the temple ban on black people was lifted. Yeah. Um, and that's a really common, you know, Mitt Romney has his story and I've got my story and everyone's got their story. So it's curious to hear that you didn't grow up hearing that story from your grandparents. Yeah, I parents. feel like it was very, yeah, they, we, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up because I don't think we ever really discussed it. Honestly, like, I think that was part of the reason why, I mean, growing up in Africa, you don't want to hear, or at least Africans don't want to hear, hey, our church didn't like let people have the priesthood and so maybe that was why it was avoided mm. uh in a lot of ways uh but we definitely heard about the after effects right the fact that our grandparents stayed the fact that they they powered through and they made sure that all the branches expanded and that my mom was like a teacher in the relief society and they were like starting out all of these processes you know uh very much well we heard a lot of that but never really like what happened in that moment other than there used to be a ton of white members. Now there's none. <laughs> and so it's like, Oh yeah. Wow. Kind of crazy. So yeah. Okay. And your dad grew up where in the United States? He grew up in Colorado. He's uh, a okay. pioneer woman. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I remember correctly, Daniel Spencer, my namesake was the mayor of Nauvoo. Mm. Um, and so we have that in the history uh, one of the mayors, because I think Joseph. Yeah, Smith I think there's just tons of. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the. Yeah, I don't know a whole history there, but as far as I know, they did that, and there was some sort of like history with Zion's Bank as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, they very much a pioneer Mormon family. Okay. Expenses. Okay. So you were born what year? I was born ninety three. Ninety three. Yes. Yeah. And how many total siblings? I have five siblings. So you're one of six. I'm one of six. Yeah. And where are you in the birth order? I'm number four. Okay, so kind of a middle middle child. Middle a child, bit. yeah. Okay, so your your kind of childhood and teen years would have been w which decades? I'm uh, struggling to do the math. Yeah, childhoods uh, most of the '90s and <laughs> 2000s. 2000s was where I grew up. Kind of the 2000s were my like prolific years. I'd say <laughs> uh, I was the like I remember when the millennium happened. I was in grade two and people were like, oh, wow, the millennium's happening. And so that was really fun. And then kind of came into like, I, I don't know, we started, I, I kind of graduated, well, I graduated in 2011, I guess. And so, yeah, the 2000s were You're just like this. Oh, 2011. Yeah, 2011. Okay. okay. Uh, and so it was just a really fun, like 
little decade to kind of go through. We had like so much stuff happen in that, I feel like. So So what was it like growing up as a Mormon child and young teenager in Zimbabwe? Uh it was really fun, honestly. The honest truth is I don't think a lot of people knew about Mormonism, right? Like not enough people knew about it to be able to say anything. What I did grow up with was a lot of like Baptist and or evangelical people that had like anti-Mormon rhetoric or they'd like preach at the pulpits and be like Mormonism is satanic. Um, but it was always like super far reaching, right? Like I remember one time sitting in a class when I was about like 14 and uh, it was funny, <laughs> there was, it was we, I was a part of the one year where there were three Mormon guys. It was the one generation, I guess, the one year where there was mostly Mormons. It was like the most Mormons in one generation. Uh, the rest of the years had like one or two here and there. Um, and so we all were at the same high school. One of them was my cousin. And uh, I remember guys were talking about him being such a great rugby star. He was a big jock. People were talking about him. And they were like, yeah, but he's Mormon. Oh, oh Mormons, those crazy Mormons. They believe in astrology. And I was like, <laughs> I remember. Astrology? Well, that's and that's, that's all they said. That's all they said. And I was like, what? This is so stupid. So I remember interrupting the conversation and being like, hey, I'm also Mormon. We don't believe in astrology. You just <laughs> believe you'll get your own planet one day and that God lives on a star called Kolob. Yeah. It's very different. It was just, very, yeah. I, well, and I didn't even know that at that point. Like, I didn't know the in-depth parts of Mormonism. At that point, I had just like had a very basic knowledge. They were like, oh, they believe that Joseph Smith is the savior. Or at least they asked me that as a follow up question. They were like, well, don't you believe like Joseph Smith is more important than Jesus? And I was like, no, we like believe and worship in Jesus. And I remember going home after that and being like, I stood up for my religion. I did that. I did that thing today. Did you serve when you did that? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just very it was a very interesting moment to kind of have but that was like the first moment i remember even like trying to like stand up for my beliefs or being like mormonism is, isn't what you think it is essentially um because i think honestly as i look back it was it was it was a very watered down you get a very watered down version when you're not in america right like it's so interesting growing up in in zimbabwe because you have the very basic principles of just like, be kind, be a good person. The plan of salvation is for everyone. Like there isn't a lot that they delve into. I remember the first time they did that was, again, I must've been 14 or 15. My dad had, or my, the te no, this is, yeah, I remember now. The mission president had a meeting with all temple endowed people and a lot of them were my aunts and uncles and he basically like went in depth into doctrine particularly like the afterlife and polygamy in heaven and like all this sort of stuff and i remember vividly we weren't allowed to be in the room for the conversation but afterwards my aunts all sat with my dad and my mom till like 3 a.m just crying and being Whoa. like i did not know that like this was going to be the case. I didn't know that my husband is going to have or even have the choice to have multiple wives in heaven. And now you're telling me he gets to choose who he gets to be married to. And I have no say in that. And so my dad, this is the other thing. My dad is a very kind person and he's a patient person. And I think that's something that I appreciated growing up because he just tried to take the time to really like just sit down with them and be like, look, I, we don't know everything, but like, this is what I do know. I don't think it's as like black and white as you're painting it out to be. I think it's very gray. Um, and so it was like this, that's a prolific memory I have of being like for the first time in my life, being like, oh, there's more than just what I've learned in like primary and in young men's. There might be something more to like the history. And that being said, my dad was never secretive with that stuff. Like he never was like, let me hold this back. Let me not tell people. Like my dad was very honest in being like, we do have polygamous history. Um, but I think that only really came up after that conversation because I was like, well, did we have that? Did our ancestors have that? Did Daniel Spencer and Nauvoo have that? And my dad was very like, yep, 
that's that. Yep, that happened. That was the case. Um, but I also think we just like tried to avoid it because we knew it was a little bit of a, a hot topic, right? We didn't want to kind of go further. And honestly, I didn't care to. I didn't think anything of it. I was just like, that was back in the past. We're in the present. This is the thing. I also think it was funny because after that case, after that situation, I feel like my parents also de dealt with, and I didn't even realize it until after the fact, but they dealt with that throughout in Zimbabwe. Like people would preach over the pulpit, Mormons have multiple wives, and everyone thought in Zimbabwe that my mom was like a second or third wife because they were like, who, what woman has six kids? Ugh, <laughs> who can go through six children? And so they're like, she has to be, like she has to be like a second wife. It's giving um, <laughs> Yeah, well, so it was just so interesting. But then I started to recognize those things, right? And suddenly I was like, oh yeah, people are like mean to my parents about Mormonism. Like they're like very confrontational, like very confrontational about being like, oh no, you're a Satanist. Like people would just flat out say it to my parents. And I was like, oh, that feels not very nice. That doesn't feel very Christian of these people. Um, and so uh, there was part of me that also just kind of wanted to, in some way, like defend it. In some way be like, you guys are wrong. And yeah, maybe there's like something bad to it. But like, I know my parents are good people. I know my parents are like good believing Christians. So I could even cry about that because it felt like it felt... It felt sad, you know? It felt I felt sad for my parents because they weren't, uh, I don't know, seen as Christians in any way, shape, or form and in a very Christian and predominantly Christian country where people were, like, bold about it. They, they, they felt very, like, attacked, particularly by white Zimbabweans, I'll say that. Black Zimbabweans are down to have the conversation and be like, well, let's get into it. Let's talk about it then. Let's, like, let's discuss. Uh... Whereas white Zimbabweans were just very prideful, very ugh, in your face about everything. So, yeah. So um, what did that sort of persecution do to your faith, do you think? I think it, it, it emboldened me a little bit. Uh, it made me curious. Um, I remember for the first time wanting to go out with the missionaries uh, on exchanges, just because I was like, I wonder what, I wonder what goes on. Um, we had always grown up with missionaries coming through, uh, and we always tried to prioritize missionaries. My mom and dad were like, these guys have come from America and are now in the middle of like rural Zimbabwe most of the time, and they have to adapt and like learn how to just be like in these areas. And so we should try and prioritize and make sure that they like come through, have a good meal, that they're like taken care of because we want to make sure all of these missionaries are like, I don't know, prioritized. And so I had always grown up with a missionary presence. It was very fun to have them around. We'd always like try and get like investigators, but it was very hard, especially with the rhetoric of evangelical preachers being like they say they say they are satanic. Um what was nice, though, is that once I started going out on the exchanges, I felt like I started learning more about uh, kind of doctrine in a lot of ways. Uh, and it was just very interesting to kind of experience that at 16, 17. That was like the first moment. Before we jump into that, let's go back. And I just want you to kind of maybe talk about how Mormonism uh was experienced in your family? You know, there's oh, yeah, the normal yeah. like yeah. family meeting, scripture study, family <laughs> prayer, like family yeah. rules. Oh yeah, yeah. And then also like if if it wasn't until later that you learned the doctrine, yeah. what types of teachings were emphasized in your home, Mormon home? Yeah, um, I think we're a very typical Mormon family in that, well, so, so it was always interesting. We got conference talks like was it like a month or two months after when the DVD or the videotape <laughs> came out? So we didn't experience like live conference talks, but my dad would look up the like conference talks on like emails or like little website stuff. He'd be like, okay, we've got the talk now. He'd read it and then he'd be like, okay, we're gonna start having family on evening again. And we're gonna start like reading the scriptures. The amount of times we read First Nephi was like <laughs> so insane. And we were like, so, yeah, we were not a family that like could read. I remember the first time we ever made it to 
what was it starts with an A. I think it was the first time we ever made it to Alma. We were like, wow, like we are really doing this thing. Like we are really reading. Um, but I also remember being so bored. Like mm -hmm. uh, I had ADHD, I have ADHD and it is so hard to hold my concentration. But at the same time, I feel like it was very much emphasized. My mom always made sure she was like, reading the scriptures is a good way to learn how to read. Like if you wanna read out loud. And I was a performer, right? Immediately from the get-go, I was doing like poetry readings and all that sort of stuff. So it was always fun for me to like read the scriptures in like a very dramatic way. <laughs> it wasn't very reverent on my part. I'd be like, and so they said, well, well. And my mom was like, okay, Daniel. <laughs> as soon as like, cause we'd, we'd take a turn. We'd take like, I think we had to read two verses at a time and we'd all go around in the circle and everyone would be like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I'm gonna liven it up. And so I was like, and they said, whoa, 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 whoa. So. Well, it is Shakespearean English, right? Or am I mistaken? Well, and it felt like it, right? It felt very, very like uh, flowerly. Uh, oh, behold, flowerly. I stay up unto thee, right? <laughs> well, and that was my whole thing. I was just like, this is so boring. I'm going to go off. Like, that was how I wanted to do it. And so we had that sort of stuff uh, in terms of like teachings and that sort of stuff. Again, very atypical, like. This is how it was, but I also feel like my parents were, and maybe this is like what a lot of like Mormons outside of Utah can relate to, is my parents were very like chill in a lot of ways, but they had moments where they were like, no R-rated movies. We won't watch R-rated movies. Um, and then my dad would play an action movie and he was like, okay, we'll, we'll go like, if they say like the F word, like four times, we'll turn it off. <laughs> and then in some time, in some instances, they'd say the F word like, four times and he'd be like, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna like, we're gonna see how, how bad it gets. And then if it got really bad, he'd be like, okay, we're turning it off, right? Like there were just like some instances where they were like, no, again, after the conference talks, no, we can't, we can't watch this sort of stuff. We can't be a part of this stuff. Let's, let's get involved, let's do this. And then there were definitely moments where I was just like, ah, yeah. you know, let's, yeah, sure. We can watch this movie. We can watch James Bond. It's James Bond. Come on. It's, it's mission impossible. Uh, and so I think there were certain instances where like, <laughs> yeah, it was prioritized and it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it was kind yeah. of hard in, oh yeah, go ahead. Like, so like drinking coffee or tea. No. Yeah. That okay. never, that never happened. We also grew up with Roy Boss though. And as far as what I was that? told, Roy Boss tea, it's like a red tea. Oh. And it technically, as far as I know, or as far as we were told growing up, it falls under herbal. You know what this is, Samantha? Have you heard of this? I thought it was, her is it from a tea leaf? I'm Googling it. I have to know. Uh, it's from a bush. It's a bush tea. I think that is herbal, isn't it? Yeah, they they classify it as a herbal tea. And so, what is it herbal? Like what tea is it? Like a tea is a <laughs> so, plant. Like it's so, all a plant. Yeah. If it matters, so like black, green, white tea, they come from tea leaves. The same leaf, right? Or well, well, different leaves, but like they, I heard a green tea is just oh, just unmatured, a different extraction. The same leaf. Okay. Well, just I, like unmature, un, unmatured leaf. It's but green. I think the distinction is that with uh, herbal teas, it's it's herbs, you know, simmering in water. Not a tea leaf. <laughs> as opposed to okay. the tea yeah, leaf. Yeah, like a rosemary okay. tea or something. Yeah. Okay, anyway. So but you had a you had a loophole. Yeah, a you little a, a little loophole. loophole yeah. Okay. Well, and that was the thing. It was always seen as like a little loophole. And my mom would always be like, well, we don't drink black tea, but rooibos tea we drink. And there's <laughs> no caffeine in rooibos tea. Oh, and that was like so the big, that boring. was like the big argument was mm -hmm. like, oh, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, they would always be like, yeah, there's no caffeine, so it's fine. It's fine. There's no caffeine, which is such an interesting because we, we just did an episode on the word of wisdom because the prohibition isn't on caffeine or no, it's on a hot hot drinks, <laughs> hot drinks. according to Joseph Smith. Yeah, but Quite would specific. you drink? Yeah. yeah, would you drink this tea hot? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, and <laughs> that, again, you're dealing with British culture, so like a lot of people were like, "You don't drink tea. You have to you don't have drink. a tea that you'll drink at someone's house." Yeah. Well, and that was the thing. My mom and dad again like they weren't like crazy about stuff, right? Like my mom cooked with alcohol all the time. My aunts, <laughs> maybe this is a little too much, but like they like bake cake. There is a prominent, we have a prominent moment. Like, I don't know. There were so like a couple instances where my aunts would like douse a bunt cake in like liquor and they'd be like, and now time to light it on fire. Yeah, and they'd light like it a on Christmas fire. pudding. Yes, a Christmas pudding. Yes, exactly. They would light it on fire. <laughs> there was one time my aunt made it and she was like, okay, and now we, we flump it. She lit it on fire and she was like, <sighs> and she like blew out the fire and was like, that's enough, that's okay. And then my uncles always talk about uh, a crepe night. It was a prominent crepe night in my memory. <laughs> of a prominent crepe night <laughs> a prominent crepe night uh where they flambéed crepes 
but my uncles swear that all of my aunts were like drunk off of <laughs> off of crepes because they just were like, "Woo, this is so fun!" Because I, I don't know, it was <laughs> again we grew up with the culture being like, "Hey, you shouldn't drink alcohol or tea or coffee." Coffee, coffee was off the table. We never really delved into coffee. I remember one time eating coffee cake by accident and being like, "I am going to hell." Except I, coffee cake doesn't have coffee in it. Yeah, well, and that was, I wish I had known that <laughs> at the time. But I was like, oh, I remember telling my mom, I was like, and I took a bite of coffee cake. And she was like, Daniel, it's fine. You're going to be okay. And I was like, but is God going to forgive me for this? <laughs> right? Like, I knew it was a bad thing, or at least I believed it was a bad thing. Uh, and that was funny that that was the case. But like, with alcohol and tea, it kind of was like, again, the loophole of like, mm -hmm. where do we go with this? How far do we go with this? Um, and so yeah, Roy Boss's Roy Boss and alcohol were very, very much like ah, loose. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's do like your your former Mormon testimony in one minute. So I'll I'll say a belief and you say you describe it. Okay. So your belief in Heavenly Father God was what? Uh, there is a God in the sky, and I think He's there probably, and I hope he is. Okay, and yeah. Jesus was what? Jesus is the guy who died for all of us, and I hope that I'm doing good. With that, <laughs> that's that's how you believe back then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, are we talking like back kid then, years? Back yeah, then. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Joseph Smith was jo is a guy from America who invented <laughs> the church. <laughs> that was how I like saw him. And the Book of Mormon was what? Book of Mormon. I don't. I never read it. I never <laughs> read it once, <laughs> other than like well, the, family, the family in the family stuff. But I never like absorbed any of the stuff. What were you taught? The Book of Mormon was Book of Mormon was another testament of Jesus Christ, and it was translated from gold plates by Joseph Smith and Nephi got the Bible. That's all like, or I remember like certain stories from it, but never really like absorbed a lot of it, right? Okay, and and the church was what? The church was a church. It was just church to was me. It the church, like the one and only true church? It only became the, the church to me when I was like 17. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Before yes. then it was just a church. It was just, well, it, like it wasn't necessarily like I didn't believe it was the church. I know that we were told that, but I never really was converted to it. I was just like, <laughs> we're all Christian here. Like that's how it should be. Like, mm. I don't know. Again, comparing myself to other like Christians, I was like, we all have the same teachings, but I remember having like different books, right? Like the Pearl of Great Price. I remember mm. being like, I remember doing, we did seminary homework. Uh, we didn't have like go early in the morning every day. We had like once a week. In and then you bring your homework. Age. And I was bad with it. I never did that stuff. Okay. Um, because I was like, I have other like responsibilities, especially in Zimbabwe. Like you had, to, you were forced to do two sports and a club mm. in, in school. What were your sports? Uh, it changed per semester, but uh, it was usually uh, rugby was always my like winter one, my go-to. Cause they were like, you have to be a man. You know, and me, like men prove themselves in rugby, um, which is always interesting. So true. Um, and then I'd I'd play like occasionally like field hockey. I tried cricket; it was boring as hell. So I was like, I'm not doing this again. Lost time. Uh, um, uh, what else did I do? I tried water polo, and then I did ba oh yeah, basketball in high school. Basketball was like my main one, just because I was like. Water polo was so boring, and I was like, where am I going to go with water polo? Like, nowhere. So, <laughs> I just don't want to sit in a pool all day and be like, oh, I hope I float. <laughs> like, it was just such a weird, such a weird experience to be in there. So, yeah, like, doing seminary homework was just not a priority for me. But I remember one time going up to a friend and being like, do you know the Book of Moses? If the it says this, and I read a seminary question, and I was like, in the book of Moses, it says, and he was like, there is no book of Moses. And I was like, wait, what? And he was like, like, you mean like a physical book in the Bible called the book of Moses? And I was like, oh, and I, that was a moment where I was like, maybe we don't have the same exact beliefs as everyone else. And that was around when I was like 13, 14, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. So, What were the teachings around dating mm -hmm. and morality? and chastity and then what was your experience dating or not dating as a teenager as a mormon teenager in zimbabwe yeah uh this is an interesting question because i never dated uh until it wasn't even like until the last year but i definitely like did not acknowledge girls and tried to avoid women in general <laughs> and i put this in my stand-up sets all the time i just like avoided women like i was like if i don't talk to women then guys can't be like who are you dating now um, that being said, it was, 
I will say this. So my grandfather was uh, very much in the, well, he was a sex educator, uh, particularly HIV educator. He would go into rural, uh, like rural villages, uh, distribute stuff to help people with HIV. Can you, can you talk about why in Africa the HIV thing was significant for those who just don't know the history? Well, um, people just don't have the care necessary to be able to kind of treat it. And so, or, or prevent it or prevent or the it education? In, gen in general. And honestly, uh, rape is very prominent. Um, sorry, that's, it's, it's sad. Um, I like grew up with that ever. Like it, it's really hard cause you see, um, like ba we would go and see abandoned babies. We'd go to like little orphanages where kids had HIV. Sorry. I don't know why that just hit me like a, ton of bricks but it was it was crazy we would try very hard to and i think this is again another reason why i was maybe more converted than other people it was just because i wasn't really converted to the church i was converted by what my parents and my grandparents wanted us to do which was help people and so we'd go into these rural areas with toys and clothes and medicine to be able to kind of help these people that just were like suffering uh, in Africa, there was no real education. And so that's why my grandfather was so adamant about it. He was like, we need to educate people on no how... No real education where? Sorry, what was that? You, did you say there, there was no education? No in... it, no education around HIV oh, okay. in general. Got it. Um, just like how, again, like you said, preventative measurements and how to like, let's make sure these people don't catch it. Or at least if you do, how we can help them stay alive longer essentially at that point because there was no real like ARVs were not really anti-retro antiretrovirals I believe it's referred to as uh there was nothing in place to be able to kind of help people in those situations um and so we had uh a very very extensive education on sex uh growing up um my grandfather had a video of just tons of STDs uh, for educative purposes, but he gathered all of the grandsons in a room and pressed play when we were all like teenagers and was like, this is what you can catch if you have sex. And we were like, okay. And my aunts and uncles were very, very, very uh, sex positive. They were like, sex is a good thing. Like my talk was, when I, my parents gave me the talk was like, sex is good. It feels good. That's why you want to do it. You will want to do sex because sex is a good thing. And we were like, okay, that's that's fine. That's fun, interesting. Um, but again, I feel like that also like seeing the STD video was just like, <laughs> that's a prominent memory because I was like, what is going on? These diseases are crazy. But you're also dealing with the worst of the worst where people haven't like received the appropriate medical attention or like anything. So we, I was very scared of like sex. I was like, this feels bad. That being said, I, I don't know. Uh, so interesting fact about me, there was a guy who was also, well, let me not out anyone, but uh, I grew up from 12 to 18, having a hookup buddy who we would just like hook up with occasionally. Uh, and pretty regularly, honestly. Uh, Starting at age 12? At age 12. Wow. Uh, in spite of these scary videos. You in saw. spite of these scary videos. Well, and So you started experiencing feelings for guys. Well, I don't even know if I'd say it was like feelings. Uh, I wanted it maybe to be more f like feeling-y. Um, but I think he was more in it for just like, this is a sex thing than it is like a... Uh, an emotional connection type thing. We were friends. We were like best friends, but we never, yeah. Uh, I always tell the story because I think it's funny. One time I tried to kiss him because I was like, this feels, <laughs> we're doing a lot of stuff right now. <laughs> well, we you're should... saying you were having sex, but not kissing. Yeah. yeah. We never, d we never kissed at all. Uh, and so that was always weird. I remember I leaned in to kiss and he was like, wait, what? what's going on? Because we never talked about it. We never said what we were doing out loud. We'd just do it, and then we'd be done, and we'd be like, cool. Um, but I leaned in one time to kiss him, and he was like, what are you, wait, what are you doing? I was like, I feel like this is the natural, is this not the natural way to go about this stuff? And he was like, no, that, that's, that's gay. <laughs> I was like, 
<laughs> you have my penis in your mouth and this is like where you're okay that's the gay thing is the kissing part of this whole situation and so like stuff like that would happen so yeah i had a such a weird i feel like interpretation of what like was okay in sex what was fine with sex like it was so weird to have like a very positive sex positive it's a good thing then you have the std stuff and then you have me having se like sexual experiences, but at the same time also being like, I know this is bad technically because of stuff. And only when I started getting like more converted to going out with missionaries when I was 16, did I start like feeling bad about that stuff. I felt bad initially. Cause I was like, this is against like the commandments. I know that much. I know that sex isn't like, Jesus doesn't want me to have sex essentially. But at the same time, I was also just like, but it feels real good. <laughs> like, I was like, this is fine. Um, so, yeah, it's just yeah. weird. When you started having sex at 12, did you know how to keep yourself safe N by 12? Uh, no. Well, I, I knew that condoms were a thing, but we also, I'll, uh, if I can just be explicit, we never had like anal sex. Like, we never did that. Yeah. We tried at one point, it hurt so bad. I was like, mm, no, that's not happening. But, uh, and so it was mainly just like, I'd say like pretty safe in general. Like it wasn't anything like crazy, you know? Um, uh, that being said, once we turned 16 in high school, they had very extensive like sex ed classes where they would put us through the, you need to use protection, you need to do this stuff. And that was when we started like thinking about it. And that's when we tried more experimental stuff. And we were like, no, we'll just stick to what we, what we've been going through. <laughs> so yeah wow yeah so like most mormons that i interview mm. and ironically mm. most mormons who eventually identify as gay or lesbian yeah it's almost 100 percent say they had no sexual interaction with anyone until after their mission yeah. if, if not when they got married in a mixed orientation marriage but yeah. like and even straight kids it's rare yeah. so so this is a rare Mormon story to to hear that you were sexually active at 12. Well, and it doesn't surprise me. Like when I, <laughs> the amount of times I had to like, even on my mission, educate companions on what sex was. Hmm. I was like, how do you, how do you not know this? Like I knew this at age 10, right? Like I knew what sex was I, I, and I had like an in-depth education on what it was. And so it was always, it's always been shocking to me to talk to, especially Utah Mormons, because I feel like, it was never emphasized and maybe I had too much of it, honestly, that maybe that can be said, but at the same time, it's also like, I don't know, like people need to have that conversation with kids to make sure that they're like, cause I think the reason why you go back to your protective, I do, were you using protection? Were you doing all this sort of stuff? The reason why I think we were so confident with it was just because we knew the, the measures that we had to take to make sure that that wasn't going to be the case, right? Like I knew for a fact that because both of us weren't necessarily sexually active with other people, we were like, it's okay because it's just us. We're not doing anything else. And as long as that's the case, we're good. We're safe. We're, we're okay. But I think in the culture from when I, you know, started actually meeting Mormons here in America, it st suddenly became like, these people don't know. They have absolutely no idea what sex is and they're like 19 how yeah. is this not the case a couple quick questions uh I, i'm guessing you don't want to say anything that will reveal who the sexual partner was i'm dying i'm curious to know if he was lds or not but you i also want to say you don't have to answer that if you don't want to either way but i guess by asking uh, i'm that, already revealing it yeah yes he was okay yeah, yeah. okay and then it, was it your impression that he didn't identify as gay even later on that he was just looking for a way to have sexual gratification and that he actually was heterosexual or bisexual or like yeah. I'm trying to make sense of that. Don't kiss me thing. Yeah. And I still haven't had the conversation okay, with him. You don't know. To be honest, yeah. yeah. To be honest okay. with you, I, um, only as I've left the, or started leaving the church, essentially have I started even having conversations with him after the fact, because and I think that's a conversation that I still need to have with him. It's mm. just like, what was that? Okay. What was that thing that we yeah. did? It was it was a unique and weird situation for me just because I felt like, I don't know. Um, there, are, there, there are some positives there and there are some negatives in that. Um, I was very afraid once 16 came around because um, 
there were instances where he kind of like blackmailed me uh, into continuing to have stuff. And that, I, I want to clarify in saying that wasn't like the common process. Both of us were very much into it. But there were points where I wanted to stop. And I was like, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. Jesus might feel bad. My dad's a bishop. I don't want to have, have to like confess to him about this stuff. Because I knew that confession was a thing. But that being said, I think that that also kind of created this moment or weirdness where I felt like I needed to lie in a lot of, for safety purposes, right? Being closeted and gay is so scary because you, and this is, the, yeah, um, it's a protection mechanism. And I felt like I needed to do it because it was the only way to stay safe. Uh, and I've only just started addressing that in therapy, which is like, why do I feel like I, why did I feel okay to just be like, oh no, I, I definitely don't, I definitely <coughs> don't have sex with guys. Oh yeah, no, 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 I don't do that. No, I don't do this. Um, and those were the only instances where I really like, I said, I told big lies and that'll come into play, you know, later on in the story, but it is so hard to have to, uh, from age 12 on, go into like these weird interviews where they'd be like, uh, do you do this stuff? Do you do this stuff? And it was like, I remember the first time I ever like really experienced it. I was 12. I was having the deacon interview where I had just turned 12. I was so excited because I was t becoming a deacon, right? They were like, you're a man now. It's going to be so exciting for you, blah, 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 blah. And the bishop sat me down and was like, okay, well, uh, I can't remember how, how the question's phrased. Do you have like, have you ever had homosexual contact or whatever it was with another man? And I remember sitting there for like a solid two seconds and being like, you have a decision to make and you have to make this believable or else mm. something bad can happen. Your mom and dad are gonna find out. And in Zimbabwe, it was illegal uh mm. to be homosexual or how do any homosexual acts mm. and so in that moment i was just like there's a lot working against me i'm going to be very believable in this moment and i was like oh no no um and i knew to just like give one one word answers from that point on and so that was the something that i had to like kind of really confront more recently was i spent most of my teen years lying to these spiritual leaders and being like no i didn't have sex because I was so afraid. That being said, and those were usually the moments where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. We've been doing this. If I stop for a, a time or if I just stop this, then we don't have to keep going. And it lasts for a little bit. And then uh, the guy, we'd get back into it. We'd st start doing stuff again. And then it would come up for another interview. I'd be like, no, I don't want to do this. And then also like sacrament, passing the sacrament. My dad would be like, we need you to pass the sacrament. I'd be like, okay, I don't want to do this, but now I have to. So uh, I always had like a weirdly guilty conscience about it occasionally. But again, it never stuck out super hard. So, Did you, uh, maybe pre-16, did you feel like a general sense of worry that you were gay and like that this was a culture, a church that was going to demand that you marry a woman? Um, I was nervous about it, but I think I just held out hope that I was bi. Mm. <laughs> like, I was like, maybe I can make this work. I, like, it's so weird that I, from 16 on, I had the thought, oh, I could just, like, use Viagra, probably. <laughs> like, I was like, it'll be fine. Like, Aww. I'll just use Viagra. Like, that'll be okay. Guys have done it. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a stupid and weird thought to have, but yeah, I definitely, it was definitely on my mind mm -hmm. at certain points. Um, you know, when I started doing the research I did on LGBTQ Mormonism, it was very, very common for gay Mormons to be taught that, um, they were gay either because of some type of dysfunctional relationship with their parents mm -hmm. or because of abuse. Yeah. And uh, I I got in the habit of bringing this up whenever whenever I interviewed a gay Mormon because well the abuse is so rampant in the Mormon Church yeah that <laughs> chances are if you're gay you there's a good chance you were abused but people can do the correlation not causation thing mm. and make false uh, correlations there because there's plenty of boys that were abused who 
didn't, you know, come out as gay. But somebody might listen to this and go, well, that's why you became gay is because you were sexually active with a boy when you were 12. So I want to give you just a chance to address someone who might still have the, and by the way, the psychological literature, as far as I'm aware, yeah. shows zero correlation between abuse and yeah. your, your sexual preference. So well, what was your experience? Well, and that's, that's the thing that I think is unique for me is I had, I had no abuse, like absolutely no abuse. And that was when I first well, this, came up. I guess someone could say this, these experiences with this other kid yes. were maybe abusive in some way. Or? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I should clarify. No previous abuse okay. before this. Stuff. Oh, okay. The blackmail. And again, there was only a few instances where that was like, that was the case. Uh, because again, for me, it was also gratification. There was like, hey, I also like how this feels and I also like how this goes. But the blackmail moments were obviously like emotional abuse. Um, in my particular situation though, I think I, I received the most abuse from myself in the way of like, I emotionally abused myself and I put myself through a lot of just like, you're a bad person, this is what you're going through. Uh, at the same time, like, again, I just go back to, I, like, I also made these decisions because I was gay. I think I knew that at that point. So you um, knew that from an early age? I, th I th Yeah, I knew I was different from early on. I was obsessed with Barbies and ponies, but I also knew in Zimbabwe that it was, again, it was about protecting myself and making sure that people knew or thought that I was straight. I. I had a lot of a lot of very manly jock cousins. They were all giant rugby players. They played on the national teams, and I was the only grandson uh, of my grandfather, who was the Rhodesian rugby captain, who was this like kind of fruity, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like very different. They were like, "This is a Neil's grandson." This is Reg Neal's grandson. <laughs> They're like, compared to all the other grands, this is the one. And I was like, yeah, this one who's reading poetry and winning prizes for poetry readings is also part of the Neal family. Um, so it was, it was always, it was always so interesting. But I, if to those people, I would just say like, it's it's frustrating to have people be like, well, abuse is so prominent, abuse is so crazy. But I, like. At a certain point, I think everyone knows or everyone can kind of decipher if they're slightly different. And it's not up to outside influences. A lot of the time, it makes it more confusing for sure. But at least in my instance, I knew from an early age that I was gay. I knew I was different. And I just wanted to kind of express that in some way, shape or form. And regardless of the abuse, the abuse just kind of made it honestly even harder to be more gay because I wanted to be who I was no matter what. And I think maybe that was part of the reason that I kept trying to like go back and forth <clears throat> between it was just because it was like, uh, this is so horrible. If anything that like, and that's the other thing, they don't look at the other side of the abuse, the way the church abuses it, right? The emotional abuse I had to go through because the church is saying you're a bad person because you do X, Y, Z, you know, it hurts. Um, and it makes me feel bad constantly. So, yeah, it was just really, really weird to kind of go through <coughs> in general. Um, and if somebody said, well, just being sexually active with a boy at 12 can maybe put you down that path. Just like Spencer B. Kimball in Miracle Forgiveness yeah, said yeah, yeah, yeah. that masturbation can make you gay, which is also silly. I, I, I'd probably be laboring the point, <coughs> but... but no, but it, it's 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 so it's very much part of the conversation, and I feel like people want to make up excuses for why people are gay, and it's like no, like the reason I did it at twelve. Funny how when I went hit puberty, I was like, I think I want to touch a guy. Yeah, I think I want a guy to touch me. <laughs> like that is naturally genetic. That is what I was feeling at the time, and that is what I wanted, and that's why it happened. It wasn't because, oh, I had gone through so many different things beforehand. It's no, it was. The two of us wanted to express differently how we felt towards each other. For him, it was more sexual. For me, it was that I was gay. And I was like, oh, this is how I want to get off. And emotional because you wanted to kiss him. So I did. Yeah. And yeah. And that was the other thing. <laughs> it was like gay. very much like 
maybe this is the right time. And that was the only thing is like, I had to protect myself in some way, shape or form. But at the same time, I was very, very, very into it at that point. But also thinking about your question, John, kids will experiment with people of the same sex and not become gay. Like it's, it's yeah. not a binary. Sometimes what you're drawn to when you're younger is different from what you're drawn to as you're older. It's like sexuality is ever evolving. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't seem like there's a fixed way one way or the other, you know? Totally. It's yeah. just like you wanted to do it. Yeah. Uh, I just like to hit those questions. Well, and the guy that I had those experiences with, he's married to a woman and Cute. they're not in the church. Mm. So like they, they have a happy relationship as far as I know. Mm. So like. Didn't make him gay. It didn't make him Maybe. gay. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's so Unless it's he's so doing that out of fear. Like what would happen in Zimbabwe if you were a teenage kid caught being gay? Like. Would they put you in jail? Would they? I honestly, you? I, I mean, sure. I'd never heard about that stuff, but I did. There was one instance where a boy came out as bisexual, and I remember the whole school wanted to like beat him up. Oh, um, but he was also a black belt in taekwondo, <laughs> and so one kid tried to come at him, and he beat the shit out of him, mm. and everyone was like, "Okay, Amazing. well, maybe we don't beat up that kid." But uh, I remember being so like. One surprise, but also just being like, wow, I wish I had the same courage that that kid had to just be like, yeah, maybe I am into dudes, right? Like, it just takes that, like, in those small instances of courage to be like, hey, I was too afraid. I was too afraid to even try and find out. But there were definitely people that were thrown in jail uh, constantly for being caught doing gay stuff. So I imagine if I had been caught in some way, shape, or form, it might have been the case. But, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Okay, so you were earlier going to go into like once you started doing splits with the missionaries. Oh yeah, yeah. and started learning more of the deeper doctrine. Do you yeah. want to do you want to jump back to that now? Oh yeah, that'd okay. be great. Um, basically, what ended up happening was that we had a lot of uh, well, the missionaries were coming over to teach uh, my sister's best friend uh, the gospel. Uh, my sister's best friend had. S she had grown up with us since age five. Her and my sister were inseparable. They had, I think they were two days apart with their birthday. So they always had like shared birthdays. It was very fun. Um, and watching the missionaries teach was interesting to me. It was intriguing because I wanted to be a part of that in some, like some way, shape or form. I was like, these guys are very confident in what they believe in. And again, I was kind of being confronted by friends who were saying the weird stuff of like, Joseph Smith believes in astrology. And I wanted to know more about my own beliefs, I think. Um, because again, I think I can be converted to like the kindness aspect of Christianity, of being like, be kind, be good. God loves us, right? Like blah, 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 blah. Uh, but I wanted to kind of delve more into actual doctrine. And so uh, I remember turning 16. And as soon as I turned 16, I, my parents were like, now you can go on splits, ha, ha, ha. And I was like, yes, I want to do that. I want to do that thing. And so I went up to one of the missionaries and I was like, I want to go on splits. And they were like, that's actually great because we're starting a branch and we go out every Sunday. Do you want to just come with us every Sunday? And I was like, okay. And I remember we would spend from like 2 p.m. to like 8 p.m. just in this rural bush area. Uh, it was around this place called Dombashawa which was uh, a small rural commu community. It's famous for having cave paintings. Um, and so that's always how I thought of it. I was like, oh, Dombashawa, the place with cave paintings. Uh, but suddenly I started exploring like the actual like villages. And now that's expanded, I think. It, was, it became one of like, the most prominent like wards uh, after my mission, after the fact, but we started like that process. And so that was where I, that's where I feel like I first like received my first like true conversion processes. But I also feel like it was a lot of just like random happenings. One that I can't explain, and I can't remember even what like the section of DNC was, was there was a moment where this guy was like, Ugh. this member was like, I want to know if I should give my land to the church. And he, he was like, I just don't know. And the missionary beforehand was like, hey, this guy wants to give his land to the church to build a, basically like the building, the church building on. And he's just really struggling with that. And we don't know if he's going to do that or not, but we'll see. 
And we go in and he's, he, this, the member expresses it and we pray. And then he's like, okay. Uh, and the missionary's like, okay, Daniel, what do you want to, what do you want to teach him to tell us a principle? And I, not knowing any scriptures, again, I have read the scriptures of my family. I don't know what scripture to turn to. I don't know what page things are on. I just open my scriptures to a random page and I turn to DNC and I start reading and it's like, and you will give your land Whoa. to the church and everything, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> I can't explain this. This is crazy. Like, I was like, this is wild. And to this day, that's the one of the two instances I have where I'm like, I don't know how to explain this. Like, it was weird and it was a weird happenstance, but also like kind of wild, right? Like kind of a crazy experience to have as a 16 year old being like, I've never read scriptures. I opened the scriptures and suddenly I told this man exactly what he needed to hear. Um, and so I remember going home after that and being like, oh my gosh, it's crazy when you open the scriptures and pray. And my parents were so happy and excited to like, see me going through that experience, you know? And from that point on, I felt very, very, very strongly that I wanted to have more of those experiences with missionaries. And so I kept going on exchanges, trying to have experiences like that again. And uh, I wouldn't say that I had any more experiences like that on those exchanges. It was more just kind of like helping people. We went and like painted schoolhouses and we went and taught people who really needed help. We helped like mothers who like their fathers had abandoned their, them and their kids. And like, yeah, it was just really fun experiences to just have as like 16, 17 year old being like, I'm helping people genuinely like live a better life. And so the church is good because I'm doing this for people, but it's Africa. Like I was like, I could be doing this. And I had been doing that my whole life, right? Like we'd worked in charities my whole life, just going through and donating products, educating people about HIV, doing all the like weird workshops and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, it was an interesting process to go through, but I feel like that was like my first like conversion process. Mm. Checkmate, Samantha. What do you mean? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, well, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but I mean, that's a, there's this idea and I remember too, I was taught this in seminary that like in, in your hour of need to facilitate your own or someone else's conversion the Holy Ghost will inspire you to flip to just the right section of the scriptures. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I was taught, well, if that happens, then the church is true. <clears throat> yeah. That's what I meant, Samantha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that and that when that happens, it feels really compelling. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If it, well, and that was the thing is I feel like the fact that I turned to DNC of all places, I feel like there's a lot of situations in DNC that's like, give everything, they were asking for donate, that, yeah. give everything. So yeah, it was, it was, it was so weird to me to yeah. be like, uh, weird that I didn't turn to a Book of Mormon verse, but I turned to DNC instead. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Again, that's probably one of, I think that's the only instance where I can't like really explain it. I'm like, ah, oh, that was wild, but yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. So anything else you want to share about your kind of, pre-mission experience as a Mormon, Mormon kid that's relevant to your faith journey or life journey? No, yeah, that's about it. Okay. It feels like, yeah. So your dad was a bishop at some point? Yeah, I think, I can't remember if he was a bishop like twice growing up, but yeah, he was a bishop uh, right as I was leaving on my mission, actually. Okay. Um, and when, from like my 16 year old self to like when I left, essentially, he was, and did your mom serve as Relief Society president? Yeah, she was prominently, she was primary, primary president for so long. Uh -huh. um, and then I think she became Relief Society, stake Relief Society president, uh, kind of around the same time my dad was the bishop. Okay. Okay. So your dad sends you on a mission. Where'd you, where'd you want to go and, and where did you end up going? <laughs> uh, it was interesting because I, again, I, I feel like I had like converting moments but I still was doing stuff that wasn't exactly like Mormon. Uh, the reason I stopped, well, when I was 17, I drank my first like bit of alcohol, right? Uh, I wanted to be, it was the first time I was included in like the popular kid circles. People started finding out I was funny. <laughs> so I was like, yes. hey, this guy's kind of cool. We like him. This is fun. There was girl, and this is the first time I was confronted with like girls being interested in me. But um, 
in the last two years of high school, we had a program, because I went to an all-boys school, uh, we had a program where girls were introduced in the, final, or like the last two years of high school. And so I was experiencing girls flirting with me and whatever, whatever. And so I acted the way I felt like I needed to act, right? Like I went to parties and they were like, have a shot. And I'd take a shot. And I didn't really feel like connected with it. I wasn't like, I need to drink. I was just kind of doing it because I was like, yeah, this is, this is how regular teenagers act. And then in the last year of high school, I was like, maybe I should put this off. Maybe I should like actually be serious. Started having those moments of with the missionaries on the exchanges. Wow. This is crazy. I, I maybe this is real. Maybe God is like really kind of changing my life. I was fasting for the first time, and that was crazy. And then I passed exams, and I'd be like, it was because I fasted. And I was like, well, maybe you also like studied really well for that stuff, you know. Um, and so I, I had like these like kind of converting moments, but never really was like fully into it, right? Um, come up to the point where I need to leave for BYU. I go to BYU. A year before your mission. Uh, yeah. Well, so uh, in Zimbabwe, we graduate in December, technically. So uh, we are from January to December. That's our school year. Um, and so we technically graduate in January. I start attending BYU in spring semester. Uh, so I did spring, summer, fall, and then left. But um, So BYU Provo. BYU Provo, yes. Okay. You uh, your mom was more of a Rick's. Yeah, yeah. Well, did she go to Ricks? You went to Ricks. Yeah, yeah. yeah Both yeah, of them yeah. went to Ricks. But my parents always told us about the magical Mormon school in the mountains, right? They were like, "It's amazing," and there's Taco Bell there, and you'll like <laughs> love it. And I was like, "Yeah, this is great." And obviously, we had visited. We had only visited America twice in my life: once when I was six, and once when I was sixteen. And when I was sixteen, I got to see my s sisters move into. They went to. They moved into a place called Alpine Village, which was like a very fancy. Mm, yeah. like, it was like the uppity like place. Wait, in Provo? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I lived there. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they had a plasma screen TV. It was like, oh, the fancy place, right? I don't know. Maybe you can tell. Like, it was alright. <laughs> yeah, like that's yeah, fine. But so that was the thing is I wanted that college experience where I was like, oh, this seems so cool. I want to come here. Um, especially because people were like, and again, I had been kind of converted, so they were like. A Mormon school would be great. That being said, I got, to, I had to choose actually. I had to choose between, I had the opportunity to potentially attend NYU or BYU. And I chose BYU mm. because I was like, my parents were like, it's cheaper, you should do this. And I was like, yeah, but I want to be a writer and I want to do comedy. NYU feels good. And they were like, okay, but do you want to spend that much money? And I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. So I made the decision to go to BYU. And sometimes I think back on that and I'm like, what if I had just attended NYU? What if I had just gone to New York and just done the thing that I knew I wanted to do? I knew I wanted to do comedy. I knew I wanted to write. But yeah, I was like, okay, BYU, I guess. I'll do BYU. They have a fun animation program. We'll see what happens. Uh, I started doing all the classes and I started attending with the guy that I was a hookup buddy with. Uh, mm -hmm. We both go to BYU at the same time. And he starts mm, yeah i guess like i i mean that's not my story to share but he essentially does not do the byu thing he immediately finds people that are like hey let's party let's like have some fun but all in secret at byu i am very much like no i'm just gonna chill i'm gonna do my own thing i'm gonna just be a good mormon and in and amongst that process uh, we come to general conference in full semester and Thomas S. Mons announces the age change. And at this point, I've partied with the guy that I came with from Zimbabwe. Uh, we have been like going out to clubs. I haven't been doing anything, but just going out to stuff and like partying. But in full semester, I feel like it suddenly became this big movement of like, if you're not serving a mission, then what are you doing? They just changed the age. Like, how dare you not go and serve? So... I start putting in all my papers. At this point, I what waited. Year, this is, you say this is 15? What this is, is 2012. 2012. Yeah, okay. this is 2012. Okay. Um, and so I essentially was like, I guess we're going to do this thing now. Like, let's see how this goes. Um, I put in my papers. I've also, like, while we're at BYU, we don't hook up at all. 
the last time we hook up was when we were just about to leave to BYU, I think, or just before, like somewhere around the Christmas of 2011. Um, and so I'm like, okay, I've waited long enough. They keep interviewing me and being like, have you ever done like homosexual stuff? And I'm like, no, I keep using the defense mechanism. No, I'm fine. And I was like, God will forgive me eventually. Like, I just, I can't say it out loud. I don't want to say it out loud or else I'm going to have to wait. Because I remember, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I remember having the conversation with the bishops, or they had a giant meeting in Elders Quorum where it was the bishops and stake presidents being like, this is the amount of time you have to wait if you've committed a sin. And if you've like, masturbated it's a few months if you've watched porn it's like six months if you've had sex it's a year if you've had homosexual sex it's two years and i was like right now you want me to wait as the age change stuff is happening and people are like if you're not serving a mission ew you're gross uh so i was like i don't want to be like shamed at byu i like i feel like i have to go right now or else like people are going to be like really like not with it you know so i keep Saying no, like, have you had sex with a man? No, 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 no. Um, had you ever come out to anyone as gay ever up, mm -mm. up to this point? No, really? yeah. First person I ever came out to was my mission president. Oh, okay. Um, because uh, I get on my mission. Well, where, where'd you get called? Oh, uh, Vancouver, Canada. Oh, fun. BC. Nice. Yeah. Uh, nice area, Columbia. right? Oh, very beautiful. Yeah. And I got to see most of it, which was wonderful. Um, I'm about like four and a half months in. Uh, one of my MTC buddies, we had become friends. He confessed to some stuff and went home and emailed me about it and was like, hey, around the three-month mark, was like, hey, just so you know, I've gone home. Uh, if you want to contact me, here's my regular email. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see if I come back up. And I was like, huh, interesting. And suddenly it's on my mind. I'm like, huh. Uh, at the three-month transfer mark, the mission president's wife gets up and is like, well, if you have not repented of something that you needed to repent of, you will not be a good missionary, period. Mm. Like, you will not be a good missionary. Mm. Um, and so I'm like, ooh. So it just preoccupies my mind, the whole transfer. Explain to, let's just say, never Mormons, yeah. why that's so heavy for a Mormon missionary. Well, In terms of like people's potential eternal salvation, right? Yes, yeah. Well, it was mainly because I was like, so my first tr two transfers was with a guy who was very high energy and very like, yeah, let's go out and do this stuff. And I felt very good and we were seeing success. But my, my three month transfer, I was with a guy who was very low energy. And I found out later that he was like, oh, I broke him. I wanted to break him of his like weird, like we need to go out and like do stuff. He was like, I wanted to make sure that he wasn't feeling that way. And so uh, I basically was feeling down. It was the first time I was experiencing depression in that way ever. Like I was feeling bad about not helping people come into Christ and like live the gospel. I wasn't seeing investigator numbers pop off. I wasn't seeing like baptisms. I wasn't seeing any sort of success. And so I felt like I was directly the problem suddenly right and especially after the mission president's wife said that stuff at the transfer meeting i was like it's me i'm the issue i'm such a problem that now we're not seeing any success it isn't that i'm not like talking to enough people it isn't anything where i'm just not going to see success unless i actually repent and and there's there's an episode that we'll refer to in the show notes where there was a missionary who felt so bad about not achieving success on the mission tying it to his own, in in his case, masturbation. Yeah. He felt so much guilt and shame that he was depriving non-Mormons of their potential salvation yeah. because of what he felt was his own wickedness. Yeah. That he actually had the thoughts that he wanted to chop off his, his penis. Really? Oh. Uh, because he had that level of guilt that his uh, supposed wickedness was preventing others from, from returning to live with God. Yeah. So, I mean, that's an extreme example. But... Yeah. I mean, but that's that. That's how you think, right? It's it's weird because you suddenly go to those extremes. And again, I'm going for the, through for the first time my conversion process. I've never read the Book of Mormon th fully through. Uh, I had never read it until my mission, and suddenly I am, 
I'm surrounded by the gospel. Uh, in Zimbabwe, I had never experienced that, right? BYU is the first time I was surrounded by Mormonism and the culture of Mormonism and how to think and feel. And so people are telling me a lot of stuff of like, this is how you're supposed to feel about it. You're supposed to feel so bad. Why are you not feeling bad about your sins? Ew, like you're gross. This is bad. This is disgusting. I missed the portion. Sorry, I just realized I missed a portion, an important portion of my story, but I'll tell it afterwards. You, you can go back. Uh, or whatever you want. Whatever you want. Well, yeah, maybe I should just express this because this was my honestly a huge converting moment for me was my first temple ceremony. Oh, yeah. My aunt. So this is right before your mission. Right, right? before my mission. Okay. Yeah. And this is the reason I think I felt so bad. I was about to go to the temple. And again, it's, it's shrouded in mystery. I remember being 17 and wanting to know what my parents did in the temple. And I remember pulling out this temple suitcase and being like, what is going on? What is happening? And I remember opening the suitcase and seeing all the white clothing. And I was like, okay, like this is just like baptismal clothes. And then I remember opening the secret like pocket and seeing the apron and seeing all the stuff and being like, what the what the heck? And I remember one time looking up, because I, I think it had been released on YouTube. Some guy had filmed it. Um, I had started watching it, and then I was like, no, I'm not going to watch. I'm not going to sit through this whole thing. I'll figure it out eventually. But I'm prepping to go to the temple. My aunt is like, hey, treat it like a literature lesson. Don't go in there thinking anything or feeling anything just like what you want to do is go in completely open-minded and learn what you need to learn. So I was like, okay. And she was like, my favorite thing to do is to open up to random scriptures in the temple as you're waiting in the waiting room and see what God wants to tell you. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting there. I'm about to get uh, the washing and anointing done. Uh, oh no, I get the washing and anointing done. And the night before I spend a little bit of time being like, I still haven't repented of what I did with the guy, but it's been a year, so I'm th I think I'm okay. It's been a year, it's fine. Um, I go into, I get the washing and anointing, and I'm like, oh, this is so great, this is so fun. You didn't, you didn't hate the washing and anointing? Uh, I was nervous that I was gonna have to be naked, <laughs> honestly. I was like, are men gonna touch me? Cause that's gonna be a concern, cause I'm gay. <laughs> like I was like, <laughs> I do not wanna like get a <laughs> in the temple right like i was so nervous that that was going to be the case and i was like oh hopefully the man is like old and gross because like <laughs> then i won't be attracted right but i was just super 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 nervous about like uh, am i going to be able to control my sexual urges around this and then they just like doused my head and i was like oh that's not as bad as i thought it was so i think that was the reason why it wasn't necessarily weird for me initially was i was just like i was expecting it to be like insane and it wasn't when I went through, they they did touch your loins when you were naked with oil. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's what I heard. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, because that's how my dad kept describing it. And I was like, yeah. I do not want to do that. But what? at some point, they took that out. Yeah. Because it was so weird. They, they would touch your breasts naked. They would touch your loins naked. Where are your loins? I did not. Wait, when you say touch the loins, what does that mean? Yeah, it wasn't your actual penis. It's yes. But like it was like, around it was that. like, think about your groin area, like yeah. where you would have a hernia incision. Yeah. Kind like of there. right there. That's and where they I was touched. touch your boob. Somewhere a breast. Like, yeah, there's, it was like, uh, it was like anoint your head, anoint your breast, anoint your loins. It wasn't it wasn't erotic for me. Yeah. But it was super uncomfortable to have some old dude touching me yeah. in different parts of my naked body with oil. But also you, we would wear a poncho. It wasn't yeah. later they sewed up the poncho so it was almost like a mm -hmm. like a marshmallow closed on the sides kind of thing or yeah. a pillowcase with the head cut out or something. Yeah. But when I was going through think of think of literally you're like 19 and you're wearing just a sheet. Yeah. It's got a hole kind of like Charlie Brown like sheet over your head where your head's popping out, but your sides are completely exposed. Yeah. And then this old dude is touching different parts of your body with, with his finger, anointing you with oil. Again, I wasn't abused, 
But like he was touching my body with his finger with oil yeah. under a, a, a sheet with my naked body. And it's not like you can be like, no, thanks. Oh, no. <laughs> this is God's most sacred ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And this is the pinnacle of your Mormon spiritual experience. So you're like feeling super weird and feeling like you're supposed to think it's the most spiritual thing. Now, again, what's weird is this whole temple ceremony where we were taught was revelation straight from God to the prophet. Yeah. And then like as soon as evangelicals started embarrassing Mormons about how creepy and weird and uncomfortable the temple ceremony was and how Masonic it was. Yeah. Then all of a sudden they took out a lot of those creepy parts and sewed up the poncho on the sides Yeah, because people were exposing it on YouTube and, and that sort of thing. So you guys were saved some kind of really traumatic and troublesome things that, that I and others my age weren't. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been, horrifying yeah. it was already nerve-wracking enough like what bra am i allowed to wear and like am i gonna have to be naked under the poncho yeah even with it being closed there's a lot of stuff there yeah it was yeah. just weird to like yeah to even have that like preoccupy your mind mm. as well it was so like interesting to have to be like okay I, I guess this is just gonna have to be my sacred and spiritual moment i can't imagine what it would have felt like but i think that's why it was so prominently on my mind was it was just like a guy's gonna have to touch me naked and I think how I thought about it was like, if I remember correctly, is like Satan wants me to make it a sexual thing and I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it a sexual thing. And then they had anointed my head and I was like, oh, that's it. Like period. That's it. That was the abbreviated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess it's just like a blessing then. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting after the washing and anointing and I open up the scriptures and immediately goes to, I think it's Alma five. It's like sexual sin is an abomination. And I was like, <laughs> after I've just prayed and I've been like, God, just like, show me what you want to tell me. And I'm scared. I was like, Ugh, that was a mistake. I'm going to reopen it again. And so I <laughs> skip through and I keep turning to pages about sexual sin. And I'm like, what is, is this a temple copy of the scriptures? I think so. Do you yeah. think people were just open to those pages? I, well, a lot? And that's the thing is I think people were just like turning to prominent scriptures and I just happened to be finding the ones that were like, Oh, don't do that. You know, it's uh, an interesting epistemology. When, when I was growing up, there's this thing called the magic eight ball. Have you guys ever seen a magic eight ball? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like shake the magic eight ball. And it's like, Oh, yeah. you'll have a good day. Shake the magic eight ball. Yeah. And it's an interesting epistemology to believe that the church's truthfulness or validity mm. is manifested through random yeah. searching through the scriptures and whatever you happen to read mm. as a psychologist. And I'm not trying to interpret your experiences for you, but as a psychologist no. now, or as someone who's trained as a psychologist, like there's, there is an element of confirmation bias where you're going to see the things you're thinking about and looking for, and you're going to like not remember all the times that maybe you did do that yeah. and nothing important happened. But when it does hit, it can be really memorable. Again, that's not to tell you it was or wasn't of God, but there is an element of psychology at play here. Yeah, and I feel like there's a way that that can be positive. Like I like to dabble in tarot, not because I believe that like I am being sent this one specific card by a deity, but just because the tarot deck I have is full of positive messages and it's just like, you know, let's just see what positive message I'm gonna absorb today. There's like, we're meaning making machines. So there's ways that that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's kind of, tapping into the wisdom that we already have within us. And it was obviously on your mind. Yeah. Like I'm a sexual sinner. <laughs> but well, in this case, obviously not so fun. Well, and I do the same thing with tarot now too, is I just, I, and, and that's the thing. It was so on my mind that I look back on it. And I'm just like, I wanted to see, I think I, I wanted to see that, which is weird, mm. right? It's weird that that's what I was like, almost desiring to see in some way or just trying to find meaning in. Well, you would have been feeling guilt and exactly. you would have wanted to, be, you know, be cleansed yeah. of your guilt or resolve yeah. it. So you didn't have to deal with the cognitive dissonance of your guilt. Yeah. Right. And, and so, and that was, it was just so weird, especially as a 19 year old. Well, and it was hard because my aunt had paid for us to go to the temple. So we're sitting in South Africa and I'm suddenly confronted with, I don't think I can go through with this ceremony. I don't think I can like do this. And I'm getting nervous because they keep be asking me like, do you want to continue? Uh, or like, if you don't feel worthy, don't do this. And I'm like, I guess I'm going to have to keep going. But I keep like praying to God and repenting being like, please God, please let me like get through this thing. I want to like 
be better. I promise I won't do this again. I promise I won't do this again. And then I turn randomly to a page in, no, no, I didn't. My mom handed me some scriptures and was like, read this. DNC, good old DNC, always coming through and giving me some messages. Um, I think it was like DNC 121 or 123. And I read it back now and I don't know where I got any of this meaning from. And so I think that's like kind of the confirmation of like, you saw what you wanted to see for me. But I look, I look at the scripture and it's like, you are forgiven your sins and yes. like, you will eventually have to repent, but not right now. But Ooh. if you ever commit sins, you will be uh, a servant of Satan or something like that. And I was like, okay, cool. God's forgiven me for now. Your <laughs> mum handed you that specific scripture? Yeah. Do you she think she had an inkling of anything? Like worry? I, it didn't feel, she wanted me to read just one of the scriptures. I kept reading oh, okay. and that's where I found like all the meaning. And I was like, <gasps> So, because there's always this experience or trope of like a kid that was gay, yeah, and everybody kind of knew in the back of their minds he was gay, mm -hmm. but nobody ever talked about it and it was never discussed, yeah. I mean, there's that possibility, exactly. Well, and I that's interesting that you bring that up because I don't know if I've ever talked to my mom about that. We've we've had like small discussions here and there about just like they knew they all knew, right? They but, did. Yeah, they all, well, they guessed at it. I mean, again, they're dealing with the son who's like, ponies and Barbies when I was like much, much younger, right? But at the same time, they, yeah, they all knew that I was like slightly different. They just had kind of were hoping that it wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. They were like, we hope that he is who he says he is. And that's what Maybe we're if we do. ignore it, it'll go away. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so just kind of dealing with that, it's, it's, it's weird, right? But, uh. Yeah, so uh, I'm sitting there, I open the scriptures, I pray, I repent, and I'm like, Whew, God's forgiven me. But I do have to repent at some point, is what it, I took the meaning to mean. Um, and so... I should just say that like one of the most brutal parts of Mormonism by far is when a Mormon missionary kid goes to the MTC, the Missionary Training Center, mm. having not repented of sexual sin, mm. but the pressure cooker of shame and guilt mm. makes that... Mormon missionary confess in the missionary training center after they've had the missionary farewell and everybody sends them off and, yeah. and then they're, then they're told they have to go back home kind of in that shame parade yeah. and like repent for six months or 12 months to then it'll be decided if they're allowed to return to their mission. The missionaries that are actually honest, and I'm not saying you weren't honest because I think it's an abusive system, yeah. but the missionaries who are honest about their unrepentant sexual sin in the yeah. MTC. That's some of the most horrific stories I've ever heard. Yeah. Well, so I was a security guard at the MTC post mission and the amount of times we had to talk, it was weird. We had to be almost be like little therapists for kids at times because you'd be walking th through one of the dorms and suddenly you come up to a random kid crying and you're not allowed to like, as, uh, from what we were taught, we just had to kind of be like, just wait till tomorrow, talk to someone tomorrow. Like, it'll be fine, go to bed. You can't do anything about it right now, but let's let's deal with this later, essentially. But you had to kind of be a little bit of a, like a midnight therapist for a lot of kids who were going through that. And I didn't know that until I started working at the MTC that like, well, we also dealt with runaways, kids that were just like, I'm done, I can't. I can't confess. I can't bring myself to talk to my stake president. They're not listening to me. And I only had that twice, but we dealt with so many others. And, you know, our, my coworkers would deal with regular. I'm not going to say it was like constantly regular, but it, regular enough that we all talked about it and we're like, so yeah, did you hear about so-and-so who had to talk to the missionary who was crying last night? Oh yeah, that's crazy. And none of us like thought deeper about it. None of us were like, hey, maybe that's like a bad thing. Maybe like that's something that like we should address. It was just like, shame, poor kid. I guess he's just not, well, then that was the weird part. People being like, he's just not strong enough or like he probably was sinning. Ugh, shame, he wasn't, he didn't repent. As opposed to being like, it's really bad that that kid had to go through that much trauma and we are not doing anything about it. Like it's so insane, so insane. <clears throat> um, and I, again, I can kind of relate to it, but that being said, like I only really started thinking about it after the fact, well, 
my first transfer, I did tell my companion one, at one point. It crossed my mind in a sacrament meeting where I was like, maybe now is the time to repent. And I asked my companion, I was like, because <coughs> he had, he had left the mission for sins and then came back. And so, and I think he shared his testimony. And then I was like, so what is that like? And he's like, why are you, why are you asking? And I was like, oh, well, no reason, <laughs> no reason, just... <laughs> Just curious, curious what it's like for you, you, the guy who sinned, you know? Um, and so... I just wanted to develop empathy for... I just, I really care about your story. It sounds like you did a lot of stuff, so... I wonder what it's like to be, like, degraded, you know, degraded, you know, bad. Isn't it interesting that we're talking about, you know, obviously you keep saying repenting, and by that you mean confessing yes. to, like... Uh, some it's the confession because yeah. it's like you hadn't done it for a year sounds like you were very repentant in your heart not looking to do it again anytime soon no well uh, that was the thing i yeah, that's a good point you know well I'll, I'll share it after the i share the full experience but i i was i was very very sorry for what i had done right i, I was trying so hard like the the fact that for a solid year i made sure that it didn't cross my mind like mm -hmm. i just like other than the occasional watching of porn at BYU, I didn't like have any desire to really like express that way. I wasn't trying to be gay. I wasn't trying to look for stuff. I had a guy who I ended up finding out was uh, a roommate who was gay and we could have done stuff, but I didn't want to. I was like, I know that I want to serve a mission and blah, 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 blah right? Your heart was changed. It was, it was changed by the whole experience of just being like, I want to be quote unquote better, right? And and so like again, leading up to this point, it's uh we're at transfer meeting. I get a new companion and um I'm just like racked with guilt. And that's I think a good word, right? Is suddenly just being it was my first time being like, I am so guilty, I can't think about doing anything else. I am like crying in the pew. My companion <laughs> who's a new companion is like, what is going on with this kid? He's about to finish his mission. I am just like bawling and being like, I need to do this thing. What's going to happen? Blah, 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 blah. Um, it transfer meeting ends. Um, <laughs> and the mission president has like a whole bunch, like a ton of other missionaries he's meeting with. But I, uh, my companion's like, what's going on? And I was like, I need to meet with him, period. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I need to meet with him. And he was like, okay, we'll wait, I guess, but we have to catch a ferry. And they, uh, I was like, okay, but I I want to do this because I'm serving in Victoria, but we're in Vancouver. So we're sitting, we're <laughs> chilling. Eventually, I just tell all the other missionaries, I was like, I need to talk to him. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I know you guys also have to talk to him, but they're all, like, I go through, I went and asked every missionary in the line. I was like, <laughs> what are you talking to him about? It's like, I don't know, just something, like, really fun, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, not important. Because for me, it's gay sex. Not important. So I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm, like, interrogating people being like, how important is everyone, uh, is everyone confessing? I or is miss it just my me? mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that, where I'm like, okay, I need to do this because I have a ferry to catch, and I use that as the excuse. I was like, I have a ferry and I have something I really need to talk to him about. I have a ferry and... No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> oh, not me. I would never repent. Not me. I also miss my mom, I guess. Something like that, right? So, and I just remember he finishes with one. This elder's crying and he walks out the door. And my mission person, like, closes the door. We didn't even, like, sit down. He was like, what do you need to talk to me about? I haven't, sat, like, sat down. I'm just like... I think I, well, I didn't say I think, I just remember like word vomiting and being like, so I had uh, gay sex before my mission actually, and I need to repent of that. <laughs> and I remember my mission president being like, um, okay, I don't think we have time for this right now. Um, I'm going to call you tomorrow. Yeah, I, sorry, I, we don't have time to sit and do this. I need to call you tomorrow. Is that okay? And I was like, Yes, that's fine. So he's like, okay, make sure that you're in a private place and your companion doesn't hear what you're saying. But yeah, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Anyway, uh, we hop on the ferry. We get back to it. I am just sad, right? Like, I am just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I might get sent home. I'll probably get sent home because it's gay sex. Um, the next day comes, no phone call. 
So I'm like, oh, no. Next day comes, no phone call. Oh. And then the next day comes, and finally, we're on the, the street. Um, we're just walking around, contacting. And my mission president calls, and I was like, oh, Spencer, like, find a private place where you can talk, and we will we'll figure this out. So I was like, okay. He's like, just make sure you're with an eyesight of your companion. I like, okay. So I remember sitting on a street corner, and he's like, okay, how extensive was this? Oh and gosh. so I was like, I start telling him on the street. <laughs> and he's like, where are you right now? And I was like, I'm on the street. And he's like, okay, I need you to go back to your apartment and give me a call back. And I was like, okay. And we're close enough to the apartment that I was like, we can do that. So we run home. Uh, my companion sits. We had like two separate, we had like a three bedroom area. So it was like kitchen, like bathroom, and then bedroom sort of like set up. It was really weird. So he sat in the living room and we had like the bathroom in between and then me confessing in the other room. <laughs> and so I went through the whole process, went through and like told him everything. And he's asking me all the like very detailed questions, like how extensive was it? What happened? What was the process? Like, did you ever do this? Did you ever do that? Where did he touch you? Blah, blah, blah. Um, which did that, did that feel, how did that feel? Cause there's the, sometimes there are people who have felt like when a leader's asking them details, <coughs> you know, did you orgasm? Was it over the clothes, under the clothes? Did yeah. you enjoy it? That sort of thing that it felt, well, number one, like a huge violation of boundaries, but, but even sometimes like it was abusive in some way, how did it feel for you? It, I, I will say that it was not, it was not a negative experience. Uh, I had a lawyer as a mission president at the time, and I would say that he held, he, he handled it very sensitively. Um, and I think he I, he wasn't actually so detailed in the like, was it under, was it over? He asked, he was just asking like the right kind of questions. I feel like kind of questions that I think a mission president should ask someone in those situations of like, it wasn't necessarily like, how many times have you orgasmed? He was just like, did it happen? How many ha times did it happen till completion? And I was like, X amount of times. And he was like, okay, interesting. <clears throat> How long did it happen? And so it was just like, he didn't go so into detail that it felt like an intrusion of like my privacy. Uh, so that being said, it was <laughs> still intrusive. Like it's yeah. still, it, the fact that he was still asking the intrusive questions were, were weird, but in retrospect, like in retrospect, but now, but like thinking back on the moment, I would say that it still felt good because it was the first time I was saying out loud, I've done something gay, <laughs> right? Like that was the other thing though. He was like, are you gay? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, I want to get married to a woman. <laughs> oh yeah, I definitely, he, I remember you, him asking me like, do you still want to go through the temple with a woman? And I was like, yes. What he ended up doing was sharing his testimony of how he has sat through multiple, he was like, when I was a stake president, I sat through multiple interviews with guys just like you, who were nervous before their wedding days if they could do it and they all have done it so like <laughs> you'll be fine Yippee. and i was like and yeah and that was where my my testimony of it being like oh like i don't know uh, uh accomplishable were like kind of came from was like my mission president said it was like so many dudes do it so therefore i must be able to do it too it's funny he went straight to mixed orientation <clears throat> marriage yeah when you're confessing sins well it felt like that, and that's the weird thing. It feels like a lot of people jump to that when you tell them you're gay. They're like, well, at least when I was Mormon. Like a lot of people were like, and don't worry, I know s tons of people that are doing it right now. And I'm like. Meaning oh. gay guys who are marrying <laughs> gay straight guys women. Are yeah, gay guys who are marrying straight women. And loving it. And loving every moment of it, right? I had a gay ex-boyfriend at BYU Idaho. And he, he loved it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, so it was just really, it was really interesting. He... It also happened to fall on right before conference weekend. So I remember going into that conference weekend being like, nothing can kill my vibe. I felt like a weight off my shoulders. So he wasn't sending you home? Well, and well, so that that's part of it. He was just like, we have to, he was like, this is gonna be a process. I have to figure out, I have to talk to higher ups essentially. I don't know if this is gonna be okay. This isn't something I can make a decision on. Presumably the fact that it, a year had passed kind of worked in your favor. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think. So. Well, and at this point, it's like a year and a half. Mm. At this, uh, so he's like, it's been a period, like a good period of time. And it sounds like you're sorry. Same sort of thing. He's like, your intent, it sounds like 
you are feeling bad about this. And it does sound like you really are, have been trying to do much, much better. Um, and he was like, and it's, it sounds like teenage stuff. He was like, it's, uh, that's how he was referring to it. He was like, it sounds like just like teenage experimentation. And I was like, yes. Yeah, it's, oh, it's that. Yeah, I never kissed him. <laughs> like, like, again, and I think that worked in my favor too. He was, he was like, did you kiss? And I was like, never. It was just sex stuff. Like, it was just us that's getting so off weird. and that's it. Like something that, that maybe never Mormons are just going to get is yeah. I referred to this earlier. Like, first of all, according to the Mormon hierarchy of sin, gay sex is way worse than heterosexual sex, even outside the bonds yeah. of wedlock. I think yeah. that's what I would have been taught. Yeah. It was compared to bestiality and, yes, and yeah. perversions. And like you, you would never hear heterosexual teenage sex described as a, a perversion. Yeah. But I would, I would have heard of gay sex all the time being taught as a perversion. So clearly you would perform the worst type of sex you could possibly perform yeah. throughout all your childhood. And there'd be a kid, a straight Mormon kid who in the MTC yeah. confesses to one, one sex, one time with the, with the, the opposite sex and it could ruin their whole lives. Yes. Yeah. They get sent home, they get shamed. They don't return on their mission. Like it can wash them out of Mormonism in the shame parade. Yeah. And like, because you lied and I, this isn't a bag on you. It's just nope. how yeah. fraught the system is with this kind of a, you know, Bishop roulette leader roulette. You lied, did all this gay sex as a teen, won a full year on your mission yeah. and, and, and tell us how it ended. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So that it, it, well, it's also just so interesting. Cause I do feel like I did grow up with like perversion stuff, right? Like, the Hinckley era was still kind of like, ugh, gay stuff is so bad. And then suddenly we had this like weird transition. Like I remember being in the MTC and having a guy be like, I'm gay. And people were like, there's a gay missionary in the MTC with us. And everyone was like, oh, wow. So crazy that he'd be so open about this stuff. But it was weird. Anyway, um, I wait like a solid like week and a half. And as... As I'm waiting, I'm obviously feeling so good. Again, it's just kind of like, it's the first time I've told someone that I've been gay. So I'm like, I feel good. It like this out. is the spirit telling me that I am feeling good about this. God has told me like, I am repentant. And I was like, is this is what repentance feels like? I love this. Turns out it was just therapy. Like I was just <laughs> like, I'm being true to myself. Not living in the closet. Yes, exactly. You know, yeah. Anymore. And so I'm not going to say it was like an easy moment. Like the companion and I that I had was not like the best companion for what I was feeling because I was feeling overly motivated. Like I was like, I'm going to go back to how I was. I'm going to preach the gospel and suddenly success happens. But that's because I'm happy and I'm like happy to do what I want to do essentially, right? It's, it's very mm. weird. It was a very interesting moment. Anyway, uh, two weeks go by. I remember we were getting McDonald's and uh, we just we just finished McDonald's. I walk out feeling so good. Mission president calls and he's like, Elder Spence, I need you to pack all your bags and I need you to come to Richmond. And I was like, <sighs> um, and I just, I remember feeling very emotional. I remember feeling very sad, but I also remember feeling like if this is the way it's supposed to be, and I will do that thing. We'll submit. Yep. Because I've done the right thing. I've made the right choice. I've repented. If I get shamed, which is so crazy that I had to be like, if people shame me, then that's on them. But I'm going to live the gospel. Like, if I have to be exposed to all this, like, emotional and societal torture from all of the Mormon community, great. That's the price you pay for your wickedness. Yes. And it's the, yeah. it's the way that you make it right yep. is by experiencing all the shame. That's yes. part of the, what's the word? To like pay for something like atonement, I guess. Yeah. yeah. How you atone, atone for your sins. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I pack up my bags uh, and they're like, you're going to go with this other missionary. And I remember I was, uh, I get put on a ferry with another missionary who's also going home and had also confessed. And he had only been out like two transfers, I think. And he's just like, <laughs> he had come from, I think, an FLDS. <laughs> Sorry, this is a random side story, but. He come from an FLDS background and we're sitting on the ferry and he's just like, yeah, my mom's or like my dad's third wife had done this thing. And he's like shouting this on the ferry. We're wearing like our missionary name tags. And I remember being very self-conscious and being like, people are going to think that we are not the church that that does that stuff. And so I was like, ah, I hope this isn't the case. Uh, 
but yeah, we we don't address what either of us have done. He's just like kind of just say like, well, I guess we're both of us both of us are going home. Ha ha, crazy. Uh, what are we gonna do when we go home, right? But for him, he was told it's a for sure thing. He was like, you're going home. Period. For me, it was just like pack your bags. You're coming to Richmond. Um, so I get there, and they're like, okay, this elder, the other elder as his airport stuff and he gets his ticket and everything. They're like, you have to wait a few days. So the elder is going home. Uh, we meet with the mission president real quick. It's like in passing. He's like, thank you for serving this mission. Thank you. Elder Spencer, um, I will talk to you in a couple of days. Uh, we'll see what happens. You have to stay with the assistants though. So I guess like in that process, he still was kind of dealing with 70 slash apostles as far as I know. Well. Uh, he told me, it came up to the meeting, and he told me essentially it went up to the bre the brethren, whether that was the 70 or the apostles, I don't know. But he was like, we talked to everyone, your stake president, we had to do an extensive dive into your history. Your stake president feels very confident. Oh, I remember this. Well, in my confession, he was like, I have to talk to a bishop, but I can see that your bishop is your dad. And I... Um, I remember like just bawling and begging him not to tell my dad. Like I was like, please don't tell my dad. Like don't tell him this stuff. Um, Cause it hurts. Like I was like, I don't want him. I don't want him to know. Right. Um, sorry. No, no apologies. Um, so I just remember him begging. And so he was like, yeah, I won't. And he told my stick president who I was also connected to. Like I felt like pretty connected in some way, but I was like, at least that's not my dad. He's like, we talked to your stake president. He said, you're very apologetic and he understands the situation and he knows the other guy. So he's like, yeah. Um, uh, and he asked me, one, are you okay if we go and like in ask the other guy's leaders at BYU to ask him if he's done this stuff and are you willing to like help him repent? Mm. And I was like, oh, I have to rat him out. I have to tell on this guy. Cause he was like, he's at BYU, right? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, uh, are you willing to tell us what happened? And I was like, I guess, I guess so. Like I was like, I have to make the right choice. So I was like, yes, his name is so-and-so. Here you go. And I remember just feeling really guilty, but also being like, this is the right decision. I have to do this or else. I'm also still unrepentant. Um, and so... That's total like prisoner's dilemma vibes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's just like there's no win-win in there. It's just like either you tell us who this guy's, this guy's name or like we can't really like do anything about it. So I was like, okay, well, there you go. Uh, so I give him all these details in and amongst all these like days of just waiting and waiting and waiting. And he's like, okay, cool. And I, I think I waited one more day and then I went into the interview and he was like, okay, we've made the decision that you're going to stay in the mission. The brethren uh, feel like you're apologetic. They feel like you've repented. You're allowed to stay. But we will have to make sure that you're still willing to get sealed in the temple to a woman. We need to make sure that you're still mm. doing all the stuff so that he asked me all these questions intense questions and i just remember being grateful that i didn't have to go home uh i do remember like messaging my parents because p day was over that period of time being like i'm in richmond right now i might be coming home just so you guys know like it might be the case i just confessed to some stuff i hope you guys are okay with that they were like we still love you we still care about you whatever happens we're here for you so i was still happy i was ex like i was like no matter what happens my family will support me um, but I got to stay and it was a moment of, I feel motivated to be a good missionary. I feel motivated to stay in the gospel. Clearly it could have been a lot worse, but I also look back at that and I'm like, there was a lot of stuff working in my favor, but also I think the fact that they, like I had told them it was illegal in Zimbabwe to be homosexual and mm. there's other things. I think there's a lot of factors in there where I'm like, mm. I think there were factors in, as to why they shouldn't. Also, like, the tickets are, like, $4,000 <laughs> to Zimbabwe, at least at that time, right? So I was like, there's a lot of factors leading to the point of, like, let's not send him home. 
because it's probably a lot worse for him to kind of go back to that, right? Especially a two-year waiting period, so. I have so many thoughts about this. This is so interesting. But I also imagine being from Zimbabwe, it, it, like your community in Zimbabwe needs missionaries going out and coming back and having like the faith-promoting stories. Like yeah. it, it's good for the Mormon community for them to have a missionary stay out. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like return with honor. Exactly. And uh, like only uh, as I look in retrospect to it, am I like... Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because I don't think I've ever thought about it that way. Also, uh, your family was not an unimportant yeah, family within yes, the yeah. Zimbabwe Mormon community. So if this comes out of the bishop and yeah. I'm sure your grandfather had been, what, a patriarch or a state president? Yes, all of those. Things, yeah, so, so like that's not going to be good for the church in Zimbabwe. So no. you, it, there's kind of a privilege element exactly. to it. Yeah, right? in a weird way, yeah. I, I've never thought about it that, like that. Which is kind of crazy, which is my privilege showing. But like, yeah, that's exactly it. Is it's just, sorry, my mind is just being a little bit blown by that because it is such a, we were such a prominent family in the church and to have so many people look to us as like examples or so many, there's so many leaders that are related to me and to have me come back and be like, especially in a prominent moment of everyone needs to go out. We need to have so many missionaries go out. I was one of the first to go out. And so I think to have me come back, yeah, I never even like had taken that into account. It is interesting that you said that they kind of had you say like, yes, I want to marry a woman. That was like part of it. Yeah. That was so interesting because the church has moved away from doing that, right? And now they're not, they're like, we don't recommend well, marrying a woman to try and cure your gayness, but. Yeah, but this is pre Again, with the nature of your family. Yeah. 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 And well, I think it's just that like weird progression that we're dealing with where it's like, again, we had the Hinckley, uh, like I grew up with the Hinckley era of being like, this is bad. And I think that the introduction of Elder Christofferson and his brother and all of the sort of stuff coming out where they were like, oh, well, like gay people aren't bad. Like it's not necessarily big. being gay is the sin. But I was like, oh, we, I definitely grew up with people being like gay people are perverted, <laughs> disgusting. It's all the abuse they've experienced in their life. And it's all the right, like all these weird narratives. And suddenly they changed it to like, well, just like we can still be kind to gay people. We can still be like, OK, with gay people like. It doesn't matter. Like well, we grew up with the abomination narrative. Yeah, the being gay is an abomination. That's a strong word. Yeah, or a perversion. Yeah, yeah, apostate. And that, yeah, and that changed just like seven years ago. So it's 2022 now. We're talking 2014, 2015. <clears throat> yeah, where the church with the Mormon and Gays website, because of all the bad <laughs> social media exposure. Yeah, the church realizes it needs to <clears throat> stop overtly recommending conversion therapy. Stop overtly recommending celibacy. Stop overtly recommending mixed orientation marriages. Yeah. Stop claiming that it was a choice. Stop claiming overtly that it was defective parenting or some type of abuse that led, or or masturbation that led to the same sex sexuality. Yeah. They need to back off all that toxic, sometimes deadly messaging. And let's not forget, there was this massive spike in LGBTQ Mormon suicides between Prop 8 in 2008 yeah. and 2014. This is when Dan Reynolds and Tyler Glenn and me and others do the Believer documentary on HBO. Yeah. And this is when I give my TED talk saying, you know, this is, and start releasing the research that Dr. Bradshaw and I did talking about how celibacy was horrendous on average. Mixed orientation marriages had twice the divorce rates of normal ones with, with horrific quality of life ratings for both partners. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what made the church change the messaging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But then again, I just go back to the importance of stuff like this, like podcasts like this. It's so interesting because even just talking to you guys and you bringing up the privilege aspect of it, I was like, it really is like a crazy system to have to deal with where we aren't like addressing like even just like culturally how different parts of the church work within themselves and saying like, hey, this kid is a part of a prominent family. Maybe we shouldn't send him home isn't like a conversation you think about, but it's like, yeah, that probably had to happen in oh. some way, shape or form because they needed more missionaries to go out and say, hey, let's not discourage more people from doing it. Like, mm. it's so crazy when you think about all the little like intricacies that they had to put into it. And now changing the narrative of like gayness is all just part of the political or like the move to be like, well, we're not completely homophobic. And it felt like that during my mission, like it felt like that narrative was changing because as I said, I had the the gay missionary in the MTC, but it also felt like a lot of missionaries were starting to preach that it was okay to be gay. They were like, we don't like 
exactly hate gayness. We just don't want you to practice it. And so that's how I had to kind of like preach throughout the rest of my mission it was like, I wanted to tell people I was gay, but I never did. Cause I was like, I don't know if that's like important. I ended up having quite a few gay converts. And now that I'm gay and they're gay, we like talk to each other. We're like, so like we knew, right? Like <laughs> the gay I was going off a little, right? And they were like, yeah, for sure. Also, like, we just wanted to be friends with you because you were, like, also kind of gay. And I was like, no, oh, thank you. Yeah, great. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it's so interesting to just look back on it in that way and just be like, yeah, that's ah, that's insane, you know? The teaching, the, the idea kind of evolved that it's it's okay to be gay, it's just not okay to do gay. Yeah. That's, that's the way it was kind of framed. Yeah. That's what point. I was taught coming into the church in tw 2010 in England. Especially, I imagine be, as well being in Canada versus Zimbabwe, it's like they can't get away with the same kind of messaging. No, not at all. Well, and I think that's why we may, maybe had to be slightly more progressive mm -hmm. in our messaging was just because it was like, Canada, especially BC, like mm -hmm. liberal BC was yeah. like- Canada had Vancouver. legalized gay marriage by then. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And well, and that's the thing, we, we were dealing with so much stuff, like the marijuana stuff. I remember we were dealing with a whole bunch of investigators who had medicinal marijuana as like an option. And so they had to go to their bishops and be like, well, these people are like, this is medicinal. This is medicine for people. And suddenly it wasn't like, okay, it's not, it's not bad. It's just not like the best option. So like you can still go to the temple maybe. So don't like discourage people from like not smoking marijuana. And I was like, mm. okay, I we feel like I'm going through a lot of like appeals. weirdness right now where I don't know where we actually stand. Like green, I remember that's when all the gospel topics essays came out was mm -hmm. on my mission right mm -hmm. at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we had like all these like weird, like this is the hard stance on where everyone sits on I think even like the, was it, I think it was like right at the beginning of my mission, they actually like did the whole caffeine, ad, like addressing caffeine thing in the word of wisdom of being like, that is not the, th the case. It is green tea, black mm -hmm. tea, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so it was just, yeah, it was so interesting to have all of that happen during my mission. Suddenly all of these weird transitions where like the church had to be like, Okay, that's not bad. Okay, also that's not bad. Okay, also that's not bad. Okay, this is fine. Yeah, it's not, okay. Yeah, we did do that. We did do that horrible stuff, but not really like as bad as you think it is, right? <laughs> stuff was like, like it was all of this weird addressing, but I think that's the progression of honestly, like internet access, access to information, like what you were exposing at the time, because I feel like that and was- And others, and others. And oh, oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. um, ordained women was a huge moment in my mission Suddenly like, oh, women want to have the priesthood. This is so crazy. How could women want priesthood stuff? And I remember being like kind of judgmental and like, uh, this is crazy. Um, a little bit of a confession. I went online during my P day and I was like, I want to know what this woman is like talking about. I'll look it up sneakily. And again, maybe that's a sin and uh, whatever. But I wanted to know, cause I was like, this feels I feel like I'm hearing a lot of one-sided stuff, right? And I have always been a person who's like, I was in the debate, on the debate team and you have to look at both sides of the argument to understand how you argue your point. And that's how I've always approached stuff. Is I, wanna, I wanna know how to approach this particular argument. And I remember looking at the stuff and being like, oh, she's just like wanting like equality is what she wants, like equal treatment. Guaranteed, like, how I saw it at the time was like, she's kind of going a little bit overboard maybe <laughs> like with how she's expressing how she wants to do this. But at the same time, I feel like it's okay to want what she wants, but God has made it this particular way. Therefore you can't do that. And then the gospel topic says it's got released after the fact. And so I was like, okay, they're addressing it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So did you know about the gospel topics essays on your mission? No, they didn't tell okay. us until missionaries told me like, Oh, because I was I was dealing with that for the first time. I I don't know if I like really understood the priesthood ban. I knew that like black people weren't allowed to join the church, but I thought that that was part of like the political Rhodesian regime of like, well, like whites and blacks can't mix in societal spaces or like like in communal spaces. So that's why they weren't allowed to be together. Mm. It was only on my mission that I realized or came to the terms with the fact that like hey, we have some really like effed up teachings about black people. Um, 
<laughs> Again, I had never read the Book of Mormon fully. <clears throat> I came to the point in, I can't remember what book it is, where people are getting baptized and their skin color changes. Mm. And I was like, <laughs> what, what is this? I don't like what's happening. And so I remember having a moment with my companion and being like, I don't like what's being said here. This is this feels racist. And he was like, well, do you believe in God? <laughs> yeah, do you believe in your testimony? Yeah, so then it shouldn't matter. And I was like, oh, what? So we just believe that God's going to make people white in heaven. He's like, yeah. And I was like, I don't, I don't like that at all, right? Like, I don't like feeling this way. And then I remember one guy when I was contacting being like, you guys are racist. You guys think that people are going to go to heaven and be turned white, right? Like if they get baptized, they suddenly become white. And I remember be trying to explain it and I couldn't. I remember being like, I don't know what to say. I, I, because that's what we believe, like period. That's what we believe. Um, and, uh, my companion had confirmed as much. He was like, yeah, like Bruce McConkie has said that. And like Brigham Young has said that. And even members had told me, us uh, like that sort of stuff. And leading up to that point, I was just like, I am so frustrated. I don't know what's going to happen. And they released the gospel topics essays and they were like, it was again, a very watered down version of what I think was supposed to be said where they were like, Brigham Young was a bad person and he did say this, but he was still the prophet. So we should just approach it that way. There's stuff that like, the man Brigham Young said, and then there's the stuff that the prophet Brigham Young said, and that's how we should say it. And so that's how I could do to teach it on my mission was like, he was a man, <laughs> crazy. But that was the first time I was ever confronted with information that I didn't believe in. I was like, I don't like this, this feels gross. Um, and then that was furthered. I had a friend who I had started having lessons with. He was my best friend. He ended up dying while I was on my mission in a car crash. Um, but him, he got converted three months into my mission and got baptized. And then his mom and his two sisters got baptized, uh, I think like a year in. And um, he ended up going to LDS Business College. And while he was there, he sent me an email and he was like, hey Dan, like I am having a weird time because I am suddenly like learning stuff about what prophets say and this was part of this whole process uh and i was like wait like what and he was like well my roommate the other day said <laughs> he gave me the full story and basically how it went is his roommate was like hey man i'm sorry i haven't talked to you for three months since you moved in it's just like i've never been like around a black person before oh my God. um and so like that's been kind of weird for me also i was taught my whole life that like black people were kind of like in between in the pre-existence, like they didn't kind of decide between Satan or Jesus's plan, um, but they kind of like last minute decided. And so they got burnt by the veil and that's why you guys are black. Whoa, <sighs> I've never heard burned by the veil. That's a Did new you hear one. that? Nope. Yeah, burned he said the that he, they were burned by the veil. And so I was like, <clears throat> Like their spirit color? Like, I don't know. They, he said that the body was burned. <laughs> and so I was like, that is that's like, how it was. honestly, I'm not gonna sugarcoat that one. That's just fucked up. Like I was like, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to say sorry for that. Like if someone has actually taught that and he was like, I laughed about it. Cause he was like, he, he told me in the email, he was like, I just had to laugh about it. Cause he was like, how racist do you have to be to like make your gospel racist? And I was like, yeah, that's so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> and then I was like in the middle of learning all this <laughs> stuff. And I was like, oh, that's mission. not fun. Right. The, the, the thing that, I'm dying to just, and maybe you haven't really reflected on this, but like, it's one thing for us in the United States to grapple with racism, but the, but the priesthood ban was centered on people on, on black people of African descent. Yeah, and you were an African. Yeah. So there's a, and and I think we've already addressed this that when you were growing up, it just wasn't discussed. Yeah. But like, to me, I would imagine it would feel particularly personal having been born and raised in that continent yeah where it's that continent that where that particular skin color because because a a really dark mexican or a really dark you know mongolian or a really dark even brazilian yeah you know or from from fiji yeah. they were okay yeah even prior to 1978 but if you were dark skinned from your particular continent where you Daniel, we're born and raised and your ancestors come from. 
Now that's yeah. That God doesn't want you people yeah having the priesthood or attending the temple. That I that I would have struggled to process the Africa part. Yeah. If I were you. Now that I'm not trying to project that onto you, but that's how I would have felt. No, no, that that's exactly how I thought about it as well. Well, it just felt it felt very targeted, right? Like that's all it felt like, especially uh growing up for me, like I don't know. I white people in Africa are so racist and honestly just like the culture around like white society in Zimbabwe was very prideful and judgmental. Um, and especially towards someone like me who was different because I wasn't the average like rugby playing jock as we've established. I was, I was the kid that like wanted to do a lot of like clubs, like debate and MUN. And those were seen as like black particular things, right? Like doing debate was like a black club. Playing basketball was like a black sport. Like white people weren't supposed to play it because you had to be playing rugby and you had to be playing cricket and you had to be playing water polo to be like, a good white person technically mm. and so it was like this weird it was this weird moment because i i didn't like hanging out with white people for most of my like childhood most of my friends were black in in high school and i hate saying that being like i have black friends but i genuinely did like i i wasn't comfortable around white people because it felt like it felt like they were just going to figure me out almost in some way, shape or form, right? Like they wanted me to be everything that I wasn't. Whereas like black people weren't really like judgmental about stuff, right? And I felt like I could express myself where like black people in Zimbabwe are very, very like, I don't know, like acting is a, an important part of it, right? Like the culture, like singing and dancing, expressing art and creativity is like important in black culture. In the, and I think it's deep rooted in the culture of Zimbabwean people, right? Like very much so. And so suddenly I've grown up all my life with all my black friends being absolute positive examples of just like good humanity and I've been told all of a sudden on my mission that that's not the case. That, and again, it, it, there, were, there might have been discussions beforehand, but I don't, I'd never gone in depth until that point on my mission where it was like, Ugh, the prophets were racist. Oh, like the apostles were like very, like some of them were so racist that they thought the veil burned them, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And so, um, you mentioned the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and exactly, and again like reading the Book of Mormon for the first time, actually reading it and being like confronted. And I feel like a lot of my companions would ask me as a test, they'd be like, and what do you think about blacks and the priesthood, you and your Africanness? And I'd be like, well, I, I guess I have to just believe what the church believes. And they were like, good, good. You're a good missionary now. And I was like, that, that, isn't, that doesn't mean that's a good thing. Like I was like, just because I like believe or have to be, uh, and that was the other thing. I felt like I had to believe. It wasn't that I actually believed. I was just like, I guess this is something that I just kind of like, I don't have an understanding of and therefore just have to kind of accept. And that, that didn't feel good. It didn't feel right, you know? Um, because it, it's just, it's, it's such a struggle for me still to this day because that's one where I'm just like, you get angry, you know? like so angry that like so many people had to go through years and years of just persecution on top of the persecution that was already coming. And there's still persecution in the church, right? Like I talked to so many black members. I, uh, at MTC security, it was really funny. We had so many Ghanaians, uh, working people there. From Ghana. Yeah. People from Ghana yeah. working there. And so all of us were like Africans. I was the only white African, but like there were so many Africans working at MTC security and we'd all just laugh about the, all the stupid stuff that we'd be asked because a lot of the Americans would ask the Africans like weird, like, um, can I touch a hair? What, uh, what a beautiful dark complexion you have on you. <laughs> Stuff like that all the time. But then I feel like I would get all the weird racist questions that they felt they couldn't ask a black person. Cause they'd be like, like, I don't know, stuff like, so like black people are, are they as like loud as like people's? And I was like, what the, what the fuck? right like just this is so weird i've heard that one before right so stuff like that is just so so random so gross and it's it's deep rooted in the culture and that was my first exposure to it, it was on the mission like i had all these companions asking me how i felt and wanted to feel about these things and i was just like no i feel bad that's bad that's a bad thing um and i didn't feel like i could have expressed it that way or else i wasn't 
being righteous enough or I wasn't being faithful enough to the church or Joseph Smith because Joseph Smith like didn't want to do it or Brigham Young. Well, and that was the thing. They always justified it with, well, well, Joseph Smith wanted to get rid of slavery. Well, Joseph Smith like ordained one guy and I was like, okay, cool. I guess I'll just have to use that as a justification for my faith. <laughs> right? Like, Okay. One guy's good enough, I guess, you know, but it just never, that's one thing that's never sat, sat like right with me. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say that, that was like the beginning point of like even kind of like my faith, like shaking. But again, it was the put it on a shelf because you don't know what's going to happen and we just have to kind of accept what we know. So this might be a, a good place to kind of take a break um, yeah. and then and then start after lunch break. <clears throat> um, but but before I do that, I, I just want to at least and Samantha, if you have other things you want to just highlight, like you were raised in Africa yeah, <laughs> and it's not, and you were raised Mormon your entire life. Yeah. And you're now serving a mission as a, like a salesperson, a representative for the church. <laughs> yeah. And you're a year into your mission. Yeah. You're like, how long are you in before you start learning the very, very basics about what the church's actual history was, what the church's actual teachings were, yeah. what the leaders had taught for decades, yeah. and not just taught, but there are multiple first presidencies that sign statements saying that the priesthood ban on the priesthood and temple ban on black people within the Mormon Church was doctrine, yeah, not just policy, yeah. And there's something just so profound about how somehow the church's education system kept all that from you yeah as an african yeah for your entire life up to the point where they got you to pay yeah to go on a mission to sell the church to other people that's a that's a pretty profound accomplishment yeah to put it nicely <laughs> well and so that that's that that's i don't know i it it feels it feels weird to suddenly like it. Well, not suddenly address it, but it felt weird to suddenly address it in those moments where it was just like, I have no choice but to stay out here. I just got let, like, <laughs> I just confessed to my gayness and now <laughs> I am dealing with these confrontations. And that was the thing. I feel like I got put in situations where I had to help missionaries that were like anti a lot of the time because they were like, well, I'll dispense it. He knows how to like help people because he's funny, but he also has done the same stuff as all these guys. He's going through the same kind of conversion. And I was like, no, like, I don't want to be like that person for other people. Like, I don't want to have to like convert other people. Honestly, like my advice in those moments was just like, I, like, uh, I was a zone leader for a long time on my mission. A wow. Solid year. Didn't hold you back. <laughs> nope. Um, it was, yeah, and that was a weird, yeah, it was a weird part. Um, <laughs> maybe we can delve that after the break. But yeah, yeah. just the weirdness of being put in leadership positions and having to address people's concerns. And they were like, well, don't you have concerns? And I was like, just ignore it. <laughs> in my opinion, just ignore it. Ignore it till you get home. Like, what can you do? Ignore turn, it. Turn it off. <laughs> like a light switch. When you say people who had been anti would racism be a part of that? Like, would that come up? No. No one okay. else was like, I was like, <clears throat> but the racism, right? And they were like, oh, I was thinking like, that you know, I'm like Joseph Smith about. was a treasure hunter. <laughs> I was like, okay, but the racism. <laughs> like, we need to address the racism. Like, no, I'm from Idaho. Them. That part's fine. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, well, that's how it felt. Like, I was like, am I the only one in the room? <laughs> Am I the only one that like cares about this sort of stuff? Because I did bring it up one time to, I think, my mission president. I was like, it's just like a weird thing that I'm addressing. And he was like, what? Like, why? Why is that? Is that a concern for you? And I was like, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's fine. The racism is fine. <laughs> sure, I guess. Fine. It's okay. So it was just, yeah, it's so weird, so weird to suddenly be confronted by it all in one go and on the mission of all places. Yeah, right? when you had fought so hard to be able to stay. Exactly. Right. And like I felt, went, I went through the whole process and I was like, well, I have no choice, you know? Yeah. So. And that's, without trying to pile on the church, that's, we call that undue influence. Yeah. You weren't given, you, you didn't have informed consent. You weren't taught everything there was so much familial and social pressure for you yeah. to get out on the mission. And then you were under such a shame spiral 
that whether it's intentional or not, that's how they get you. Whether it's the Scientologists doing auditing to find out anything you feel bad about and then using it against you later. I don't think Mormon leaders are intentionally doing this, yeah. but the effect of the law of chastity, the worthiness interviews, the temple recommend interviews, all that worthiness stuff and, and purity culture as, as, uh, as many refer to it, the net effect of that is to have the goods on you yeah. so that you feel awful, so that you feel like you're deficient and broken and defective, so that you need Jesus, but it's not just Jesus, you need the Jesus and modern prophets and modern scripture and the one true church, or you're not going to the good place. Yeah. And so that all of that amasses into an incredible amount of pressure and influence yeah. on a 19 year old, <laughs> Yeah. right? <laughs> yep. Exactly that. Yeah. Well said. I, think, I got nothing to add. Okay. I think, it, yeah. Yeah. I think that, like, it just sums it up in such a, in a profound way. And I, I feel like, for me, I just want to, yeah, I just wanted to find some sort of, like, learning. I think that was also the first moment that I was confronted with. People don't have answers in the church. Mm. I went to the mission president and asked him the question and immediately got confrontational because he was like, is that a moment that, like, is that something that you're going to be concerned about? I was just like, oh, I'm not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> like, I thought people would have a decent answer for me. And the Gospel Talk Picks essays was kind of an answer, but not really, like, a good answer. It was like, well, so, mo some people have been denied the, go the priesthood before. And I was like, because of their race? <laughs> no. Like, a tribe, yeah, it was because of they were bad, but not because they were dark in some way or less even like the cane stuff is so weird like cane was cursed with the dark skin like i was that was something i had also just been addressed with on my mission too i was just like cane is cursed with black skin and they were like yeah africans are cane and i was like that's a weird in-depth thing that like why do we need to know that and like yeah also he was bigfoot and i was like <laughs> i don't know what that means either <laughs> In, in our Mormon stories, we're doing this series on LDS discussions. And, and interestingly, this week, we're going to be talking about uh, race and Mormon scripture. But, and, and my Christian friends are quick to remind me, this curse of Cain being dark skin for black people, yeah. that's not in the Bible. No. That's interpretation of the Bible by, by Christ, Protestant Christians that comes later. Wow. And then it's Joseph Smith that puts it into the book of Abraham and the, and the book of oh Moses. Gosh. So like Joseph, Joseph made the scriptures extra racist. More racist. Because, <laughs> I mean, you could, the Bible was too tame. Yeah. yeah Cause like, the Bible go far enough. With this. Cause the Bible slavery is okay. Right. And there's all the genocide. Yeah. But like it, and I'm not trying to pick on Joseph Smith, but it took Joseph Smith to actually canonize the curse of Cain, dark skin as a curse. Yeah. In, in the book of Moses, in the book of Abraham, and of course in the book of Mormon, it's for Native Americans, but yeah. he t Joseph Smith takes it to 11, as they say. Yeah. Well, and then, well, you go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes it's okay to pick on Joseph Smith. <laughs> well, like, we're talking about deep, deep racism that has affected so many people, is deeply fucked up. You know, you're allowed to say all that. Well, and <laughs> you don't have to apologize for it. And so many people will like, uh, at least I have been confronted by friends who are like, well, you, it wasn't Joseph Smith, it was Brigham Young. And it's like, Okay, but what did Joseph Smith do and say and preach and write down in the scriptures mm -hmm. to make Brigham Young think that it was okay to be able to kind of preach or cut black people entirely off from the priesthood? Like, Joseph Smith played a role, and I'm pretty sure we all have to like acknowledge it in some way, shape, or form. I hate yeah. when people are like, no, Joseph is completely... He was trying. He did not do anything to ever get... It's like... He put it on paper, baby. Like, yeah. I don't know. And he could have written any book he wanted. And he yeah. chose a narrative that involved people becoming black because they were wicked. Yeah. So stupid. Wild. Well, uh, I love this as a place to pause because I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm wanting to know how your mission ends. <laughs> I'm wanting, you know, I'm wanting to know, do you go to BYU after your mission? I know the answer, but I'm, you know, as, an, <laughs> as like, cliffhanger. and then I want to know, like, do you try and date? Do you try and get married? <laughs> Do you date at BYU? Like, yeah. and then what happens to your faith over time? So like, this is a perfect place, well, to be human and give you guys a potty break, but also to grab a quick bite of lunch. And then we're gonna come right back for part two 
the concluding part <laughs> to is it Dan Dan Bam or Dan Bam Bam? Dan Bam Bam. Dan Bam Bam. Yeah. Daniel Spencer's epic Mormon story. <laughs> this has been so great. Thank you. Thank I you. And thank you guys. This is awesome. Samantha, you're great. I'm having the best day. Fun, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to Harmon's. We're not sponsored by Harmon's. Let's go get a salad. <laughs> John's making us get salad for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Sam's a vegan or vegetarian, right? No, That's... I like a good salad. Okay. Don't All right. Wrong. All right. Well, thanks for joining us so far on Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Samantha. Um, and just come right back for part two of this epic, epic episode. You'll want to hear how this ends. All right. Who will get vibe checked? We'll find out. <laughs> Someone needs to. And and can you serve, Samantha? I just want to know. Can you no, serve? Oh, down help. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what serving means. Like literally, just serving looks. The first you just gotta like make a look. Yeah. Where does I don't that know. come from? Uh, it's just Stay a game. Like yeah, yeah. Stay <laughs> come tuned back to part two and find out how to serve. All right, everyone. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories podcast. Take care. <laughs>